I want to welcome everybody this morning. We always build in a few minutes on the front end for folks coming in uh, a little bit late. Um, really am happy to uh, see people that are here, especially those that have come back from, at, in some cases, far away, and then others that are, of course, have always been here. Um, this is our 27th Augustus McCravey lecture, although we started having our alumni meetings uh, prior to that time, uh, some 10 years. Uh, I did want to uh, welcome everyone, especially the families of uh, the chief residents that are here. We're especially happy to have you, and uh, I know you're going to look forward to the presentations. Uh, I do want to mention a couple of people. I see three of them sitting back there uh, side by side, Grant and Ralston Major and Gene Scanlon. Uh, and especially acknowledge them because all of them have been significant contributors to our alumni fund that helps support uh, education here and they've, they've all three been uh, contributors to that and we appreciate that very much. Uh, we're proud of a lot of our graduates. Uh, we, we're especially proud to have see the seven or eight uh, program directors of different programs around the country now in residencies. Uh, and one of them has finally gotten a chance to come back, Amy Hildreth, who's the program director over at Wake Forest with uh, Wayne. Um, and uh, we finally set this up on a weekend when she could get to come back uh, because they had their graduation last weekend, so uh, she had to be there for that. Um, Robert Vanderwalle, Josh Worthington, uh, you guys were there. They're recent, relatively recent grads, and we're really happy to have them back. I'm sure I've left some people out, but. We're happy to have them, and then Richard Cook, who has missed a few of these lately, but he's here to, this year, and I think everybody knows that Richard's been running our skills lab since 1980, and uh, it's been a very important part of our residency program here, so we really are happy to have him. Uh, and then Bill Rowe, who's always here on time for every uh, presentation and served for a long time in our clinic. So just to mention a few people that uh, we're especially happy to have. Um, we'll we'll talk a little more uh, today, uh, this morning, and and this evening about the program and uh, and uh, his, the history of it, and have a lot of that that's going to be presented this morning. I also ought to mention that the front row here are residents coming in, and we're particularly happy to have them. A lot of times we invite uh, you folks, and they don't come, and you guys did, so we're really happy to have you. And, I think you'll enjoy the, the day and the festivities this evening as well. Uh, first, uh, we, we start off this morning with one of our chief talks. I think everyone knows every chief gives a Grand Rounds presentation. Of course, during the residency, they give several Grand Rounds presentations, but not necessarily uh, uh, just from the, 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 the podium as this is, but usually as a case presentation with then background about it. John Huggins is done several of those and does a really beautiful job with them. John is a native of Alabama, went to medical school there. We were able to get him to come here to do his residency. Uh, he's done that and now is going to be staying here joining our faculty uh, and we're looking forward to working with him going forward. Um, we, had, we had to pick between the topics for our chiefs. All of them had great talks and one of the reasons we just had to put this one in, it was such an interesting to me topic for all of us, and that's about the development of the operating room, so I look forward to John's uh, presentation on this. John? Thank you, Dr. Burns. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out and uh, spending this morning with us and coming to uh, see all the uh, presentations this morning. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Uh, my talk uh, is called On the Foothills of the Modern Era, uh, Developing developing the Operating Room. And uh, when I initially, I have no disclosures to, to report, when I initially thought of this topic, uh, I wanted to find a way, uh, because I've always been very interested in history, and also been interested in the uh, sort of the evolution of the operating room just from what from what I've seen and from what I've read in the past. And I wanted to find a way to sort of describe uh, the process of how we got from then until now. Uh, and as I found out uh, during, you know, reading about this, it was actually much, much more complex than, uh, than I initially thought. There were 
many other thens in between. Uh, this is a, uh, a scene of a surgery at home uh, in 1809. Uh, it's, in a, uh, it's in a surgeon's home in Kentucky. A uh, surgeon is uh, uh, operating for an ovarian tumor. And as you can see, this is in a, in a house, not a hospital. Uh, you have the house staff present uh, at this point in history. Most of the assistants were family members or neighbors or uh, you know people who the surgeon knew. Uh, so there wasn't a, a widespread usage of an operating room per se around this time. Uh, this is a example of a historical uh, operating theater. This is a the old operating theater in London. Uh, it was created in uh, 1821, uh, as you can see. Uh, most of the surfaces are wooden. Uh, there's a wooden operating table uh, a gallery for viewers and spectators to observe surgeries. Uh, this uh, picture here is from the Agnew Clinic uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, this, as it picture denotes, it's 1889. Uh, later in history, you see uh, white uh, surgical garb. Uh, there appears to potentially be uh, some element of anesthesia going on at the head of the bed. Uh, however, there's no, uh, there's no obvious uh, signs of any sort of antisepsis uh, in this period. Uh, this is later uh, in the early 1890s at Boston. Uh, again, the surgical theater is still present. Uh, you do see anesthesia that's pretty obvious uh, in this picture uh, down here. Uh, and you see again the, the garb uh, with white uh, surgical clothing. So you can sort of see how the evolution is sort of uh, taking place. Then later in 1904, uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, this is uh, Dr. William Halstead uh, in his first operation in his surgical amphitheater. Uh, and you can see now uh, caps uh, being utilized, uh, surgical caps. You can also make out gloves, uh, rubber surgical gloves. And so, you know, you can see over time the evolution of the way the operating room appeared. And uh, the walls are non-porous, uh, tile floors, non-porous surfaces, uh, which could be sterilized and maintained. And so looking back at how this evolved, uh, it's actually a pretty complex uh, history. And the amazing thing is a lot of this took place over about a 50-year period uh, during the mid-19th century, uh, what's known as the transformation period of surgery. Uh, you essentially had major discoveries uh, that occurred in close temporal relationship with one another. And thanks to these, we were able to uh, see what uh, the operating room, how the operating room evolved into what we see today. Uh, the first of these discoveries was anesthesia, and the second being antiseptic technique. Uh, this is uh, Joseph Lister uh, in his later years, and I've always thought this was a pretty interesting picture. I don't know what was over here, but he doesn't look very happy about it. Uh, so to begin, in order to sort of look at where we're going, it's nice to look at where we've come from. This is a quote from uh, Theodore Billroth. And it's a pretty interesting quote. Uh, it says, if one is free to decide where the patient will be operated on and later treated, then one will choose a hospital only if the circumstances are abso absolutely prohibit any other alternative, as is unfortunately the case with most poor patients. Even an isolated single room in a hospital is not as good as any room in a private house. If this principle must be violated for incidental reasons, this is a misfortune. This is a uh, quote taken from a letter uh, that Bill Roth had written to one of his colleagues. And I don't have the exact date, but I would think that looking at his uh, practice history, it would be prior to 1870, probably in the 1860s. Uh, but this is a, a pretty good reflection of, uh, the, of a prominent surgeon's opinion of operating in the hospital. So in order to, uh, to talk about the first subject, uh, uh, talking about emerging into anesthesia and the development of anesthesia. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Valpeau in uh, Paris. He was a prominent surgeon. Uh, he was a very accomplished uh, obst obstetrician and surgeon. He did a lot of pelvic surgeries. Uh, and as you can see from this quote, uh, he considered the avoidance of pain to be a pipe dream. Uh, and this was in 1839. This was actually 
pretty late uh, considering the overall history that we're going to talk about. Uh, Velpu was a uh, very accomplished uh, surgeon in his time. He named, uh, he named the uh, femoral hernia after himself as well as the inguinal canal. He also named uh, hydradenitis after himself, which, which was a very interesting choice. Uh, so talking pre-anesthetic era, uh, prior to inhalation agents, uh, a number of different you know herbs and medications, gases, chemicals had been used. Uh, things like opium, uh, mandrake, uh, henbane. This is uh, henbane here, mandrake root here. This is obviously uh, opium from poppy. Uh, a lot of these were used. Oftentimes, they were ground down into powders. Uh, they were mixed with things like olive oil, um, extracts, saffron, uh, cloves. Sometimes they were used as ointments. Uh, sometimes they were imbibed, uh, and oftentimes they were soaked into sponges. Uh, you can make out a sponge here. This is a, uh, a soporific uh, sponge, which was held over a uh, patient's mouth the nose. They could inhale these objects or the, these chemicals, and they were used in a variety of, of manners. Uh, their effect was variable, uh, and their efficacy was, you know, sort of variable from case to case. And so, generally, there wasn't any sort of standard uh, expectation in terms of what would uh, occur from the usage of these. In the 19th century, uh, you actually see that elective surgery was very rare. Uh, the Mass, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, from a 25-year period from 1821 to 1846 only recorded 333 uh, surgeries. So these, this was barely more than uh, one per month. Uh, at this time, most of the surgeries were uh, emergency. Uh, speed was of the utmost importance. We all know uh, stories of, uh, of Robert Liston in England who uh, was a very, very fast surgeon, but he had a high mortality rate. He actually recorded uh, a surgery with a 300% mortality re reportedly where he uh, injured his assistant by uh, cutting off his fingers and he did amputation on the patient and he accidentally cut the clothing of a spectator and so the spectator reportedly died of shock uh, and the patient and the assistant died of overwhelming sepsis later. So at this point in time speed was the utmost importance. Uh, there were not a lot of different types of procedures that could be performed. Uh, it was mainly limited to amputations, which were emergent, uh, couching of cataracts. This young man is uh, looks like he's getting prepared for a couching procedure. He looks pretty happy about it, which is hard to understand. Uh, but most of the procedures that, uh, that took place at this time were emergent. Uh, this is an operating table. Uh, this is a Paris model uh, from uh, France. As you can see, it's got the uh, option to uh, convert to lithotomy position for lithotomy procedures. Uh, it was wooden table. Uh, there was really no, uh, no efforts for any sort of uh, asepsis as this was unknown at the time. Until 1800, uh, we didn't see any emergence of uh, any inhalation agents. In 1800, David Humphrey, uh, I'm sorry, Humphrey Davy, uh, in England, he was at the Bristol uh, Pneumatic Institution. He began working with nitrous oxide and proposed this to be used as a, a potential agent for anesthesia. The only issue is uh, when he started working with this, the way that he would obtain the gas, the way that he would procure it uh, was pretty complicated. He himself was able to do it being a chemist, uh, but essentially you had these numerous chambers and numerous chemical reactions that had to be uh, had to be done in order to obtain the gas. Uh, and so he later left and started working at the Royal Institution of London and he worked uh, he worked with nitrous oxide quite a bit, uh, but really he wasn't really able to publish much. Most of his work was experimental in nature, uh, despite having spent a lot of time uh, working in the field. Uh, later, uh, Michael Faraday, the same Faraday from Faraday's Cage and Faraday's Law uh, from electromagnetism, he would uh, be a successor of Davies. And in 1818, uh, he reported using ether uh, as a potential anesthetic agent. Uh, as ether was available and it was easier to obtain, it didn't require 
uh, the user to, to go through any sort of chemical reactions uh, in order to obtain it. Unfortunately, this was largely unnoticed. Uh, he published anonymously, and it was in the very back of a, of a journal in the miscellaneous section. And as you can see on the right here, this is the entire entry here. So it's very sort of just a uh, just a sort of subjective sort of a writing on the matter. There was no there were no cases. There was nothing other than a subjective report. And so for the next two decades, unfortunately, uh, inhalation agents were primarily seen uh, in amusement settings, in traveling circuses, uh, exhibitions. Uh, these were primarily done in America, but they were also done in Europe as well. This is, uh, just on a side note, uh, this is Samuel Colt, the man who would one day make all men equal. Uh, he actually participated in these with a U in his name, a different spelling, but uh, he actually went under the name of Dr. Colt with a U, and he performed a lot of these uh, exhibitions. And so, unfortunately, it was sort of lost for a time, but it was at least uh, it was at least kept alive as a an amusement type uh, an amusement type setting because uh, that's where uh, the physicians who would later use ether and use nitrous oxide that's where they saw it. Uh, in 1842, 43, there were two practitioners that experimented with ether. Uh, one was a medical student in New York uh, who used this during a dental extraction, uh, but he was dissuaded from continuing any experiments uh, by his uh, professors afterwards. So that was really uh, sort of a dead end. Uh, Crawford Williamson Long, a physician in Georgia, he used ether uh, while he was excising skin lesions, but he didn't report this until later in 1849. Really, the first report of uh, ether being used for anesthesia was uh, that of Horace Wells in Connecticut. Uh, he began in the early 1840s experimenting with nitrous oxide, uh, where he had actually seen this initially at a fair. Uh, after a few years of experimentation, he decided to uh, pursue a public demonstration. Uh, and so, you know, advertisements were put out in the local paper. Uh, he went to Mass General and uh, with the help of a, another dentist, William Morton, and a surgeon, John Collins Warren, uh, they extracted a molar. Uh, but unfortunately, during this uh, procedure, the patient screamed out in pain. And so it really, it really sort of tarnished his reputation for a time, but Wells was very persistent and uh, returned later, a year later, uh, to Mass General, again with Dr. Morton and Dr. Uh, Collins Warren, and they demonstrated ether. Uh, this time on August, on October the 16th, 1846, and this was known as Ether Day. Uh, this was a young man with a neck mass uh, that was fatty in nature per reports. There's no, uh, no real pathologic uh, discussion, but at any rate, he had a mass on his neck. Uh, he was anesthetized with ether, and they were able to remove the mass uh, in front of an audience and the patient, when he awoke, uh, stated that it felt like someone had scratched his neck. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, John Collins Warren, uh, and I, I don't know which one Morton or Wells is, but uh, at any rate, from this day, uh, this, this was, first of all, it was seen publicly uh, in Boston, but second of all, Dr. Bigelow, uh, who was present for the demonstration, uh, he went on to experiment with ether as well. Uh, Dr. Bigelow wrote this up and was able to publish it soon after this demonstration. And this actually received a lot of uh, press worldwide. Dr. Liston over uh, in Europe, he actually used ether approximately a month later for an amputation, uh, and he published his results in the Lancet. Uh, so there was a lot of support uh, for anesthesia. This was uh, noticed and supported and really accepted very well. It was something that uh, people were people were happy with and they were not skeptical of and and so anesthesia took off fairly quickly uh, fortunately. Uh, the article by Bigelow uh, in 1846 actually of note was considered the most important article in the New England Journal of Medicine history uh, of their of their publication uh, during uh, their 2012 uh, 200th anniversary. And so <coughs> at this point uh, Anesthesia was accepted uh, in surgery pretty quickly, but in obstetrics, 
there was actually a, a good deal of holding out, uh, even though ether and chloroform was first used in 1847, uh, there was still a still some degree of skepticism uh, for a number of reasons were cited for this. Uh, one was uh, there was a, a belief that uh, intervening in pain during childbirth was uh, inappropriate from a religious standpoint. The Calvinists and a number of other Orthodox religions believe that any sort of attempt to relieve pain from childbirth wasn't, wasn't something you should do. Uh, and they owe this back to a, uh, a quote in Genesis stating uh, that in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And it was James Young Simpson who uh, actually countered this argument by uh, pointing out that uh, God placed Adam into a deep sleep prior to removing his uh, rib to create Eve. And then the main, the main thing that really helped, which unfortunately has uh, sort of fallen off the earth here, uh, in 1853, uh, John Snow, Dr. John Snow in England, uh, administered chloroform to, clean, to Queen Victoria uh, during the birth of her eighth child, Leopold. And so this was publicly announced. And people, you know, throughout England, uh, throughout Europe, and the world even, uh, you know, knew that she had used chloroform. And so it was accepted. It was seen as a, uh, it was seen as an advancing field, uh, and it was totally appropriate to to use it. And so from here, uh, both chloroform and ether were uh, used, uh, and with good success uh, during surgery. Uh, after this, th these are different models of ether masks. Uh, this is sort of a, an example of how to apply it. This is a sponge that's soaked with either ether or chloroform, and it's sort of mixed in this container uh, to obtain to obtain a mixture of air as well as the uh, the chemical vapors, so that you don't have uh, too much or too little of an effect. Uh, so, after Ether Day in 1846, uh, anesthesia caught on pretty pretty rapidly and had a lot of support from most people. Uh, throughout the uh, throughout the world, both in Europe and in America, unfortunately, this sort of entered a, a period uh, before the development of antisepsis, but after the development of anesthesia. And so, this was sort of a sort of a period of surgery that was hallmarked by surgeons being able to perform longer procedures, uh, more in-depth procedures. We were able to go further into the body. Uh, but there was a very high mortality rate as we didn't have any sort of antisepsis at the time. Uh, this is a quote at the bottom here, the greatest obstacle to is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. Uh, I've always liked this quote. Uh, Dr. Borstein is, uh, was a librarian of the Library of Congress. Uh, he was not medical in his training, but I still really like that quote. So going over mortality in the early 19th century prior to antisepsis, uh, there were a number of reports. Uh, one table from a uh, paper is presented here on the right. Uh, this is just looking at amputations. As you can see, uh, pretty staggering mortality rates, uh, much higher with lower extremities. Uh, you can see, you know, different uh, surgeons and their reported mortalities, essentially 40 to 60 percent uh, around this time period. Uh, cesarean delivery was rarely survivable uh, for the mother. Uh, Overall hospital mortality rates were about 25%, and that's not for surgical patients, that's for all patients. And uh, even physicians and nurses and attendants had a high mortality uh, just by working in the field. And beliefs at this time uh, were actually uh, often pretty archaic, uh, going all the way back to Galen. Uh, humoralism was uh, a a dominant theory still into the 19th century: phlebotomy, bleeding, uh, leeches, different types of uh, different types of concoctions to place onto wounds, various forms of cautery, uh, hot oil, things like that were still being used. The idea of good and laudable pus uh, was believed to be part of normal wound healing. Uh, you know, at this time, most of these surgeons had probably never seen wounds heal without pus, and so you know, it's easy to. Uh, to understand that they would see this as normal, but it was very interesting to see just how late uh, into the 19th century these beliefs uh, still went. Uh, people typically performed autopsies and dissections in the same dress that they had, uh, you know, they would wear the same dress later to operate on patients. Oftentimes this was done on the same operating table. 
uh, Bill Roth here in 1870 in a letter to a colleague again had a pretty a uh, pretty staggering quote that, stating that medical progress could evidently be achieved over a heap of corpses. And so at this time, you know, we, we saw very high mortality rates. Uh, we had the, the ability to operate and do more lengthy operations, but the mortality was staggering. There were a number of events uh, along the development of germ theory uh, that had already taken place. One is not uh, a part of this table, but I added it. So microbes were first described uh, by uh, Leeuwenhoek, I, I forgot how to pronounce that name, but anyways microbes had been described back in the late uh, 1600s. The smallpox vaccine was described by Jenner in 1796, but really uh, in the early 19th century there were still very archaic ideas about um, transmission of disease still, even with even with these advances, there was sort of a uh, period where uh, there was not a lot in the field of microbiology to challenge uh, what had uh, been discovered before. There were two major works prior to uh, germ theory being introduced uh, in 1865. These were mainly works of epidemiolo epidemiology. Uh, the first was by uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and the second was by Semmelweis. And these works challenged the dogma, they challenged uh, the idea of the miasma theory, they challenged uh, sort of the current humoralism, uh, but they didn't, they weren't able to uh, go into any sort of germ theory as, as this hadn't been discovered yet. Uh, Holmes's paper uh, quickly was on the uh, contagiousness of purporeal uh, fever, which is a, a sort of a postpartum fever that rapidly leads to death in most cases. Uh, this first appeared in 1843. Uh, it was actually a pretty well-written paper. There was no scientific design, but uh, it was a literature review, presentation of numerous cases from area colleagues. It was mainly an essay form, uh, but it went largely overlooked at its time because the journal failed shortly after publication. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of support for this this idea. Uh, he did make several uh, bold hypotheses uh, during the paper. Basically, says that the disease is contagious and it's carried uh, it's carried from patient to uh, physician and nurses. And he didn't go into any sort of mode of infection. He actually kind of uh, gave a little bit of a nod to the miasma theory by stating it could be carried by the atmosphere that the physician carries about him or it could be carried by a, or it could be applied by direct contact so he didn't go into any uh, mode of transport uh, mode of transmission but he did state that it was contagious which that in itself at that time was pretty uh, a pretty big deal I won't read all of these but he did go into sort of a uh, sort of a prescription to prevent uh, childbed fever, uh, basically mainly talking about uh, physicians excluding themselves from autopsies uh, for any type of infection, erysipelas or uh, purporeal fever. Uh, he actually gave, a, uh, gave some advice about changing articles of clothing, allowing 24 hours between a case uh, of uh, autopsy and a, uh, a delivery to a lapse. He went on to he went on to state that if you had multiple cases of a uh, childbed death, then uh, you should accept that you are the vehicle of uh, transmission as the physician. And basically, he stated that this was not a sign of misfortune; it was actually a uh, a criminal act to continue uh, practicing if you had multiple cases. Later, uh, or actually earlier. Uh, Semmelweis uh, collected data on the same uh, topic uh, in Vienna, basically between 1841 and 1846. He had very well organized data. He had a lot of data. He looked at uh, the difference between a maternity ward that was run by physicians versus a maternity ward run by uh, midwives. And when he first arrived in Vienna, the difference in mortality was staggering. It was around 18% versus 2%. And so he collected data uh, on two wards and presented this as a case control analysis. And 
he ultimately was, he proposed several hypotheses, uh, but he ultimately proposed, uh, as he noted, that the physicians participated in autopsies. Uh, he noticed that hand washing, disinfection, uh, bef bef you know, between an autopsy and a delivery, uh, that was ultimately shown to decrease mortality and make the both groups equal. And you guys, just as I, have probably heard of this study and thought, you know, boy, that really must have made a... Uh, that must have made a big dent uh, at, at his time. That must have been popular and well-received, but it really wasn't. Uh, his infection control policies were unpopular in his own institution. Uh, he ultimately was, uh, his professorship was not renewed. Uh, he left Vienna for Budapest, and he actually wouldn't publish any of his results until 1861, which was 14 years after uh, his data collection. And so even though he had well presented and thorough data, uh, he wasn't really able to usher in any significant reform. Uh, he published these results 14 years later. It was published in the form of a 544-page book, uh, which was criticized for being contemptuous and poorly written. And uh, he would later go on to die in a public asylum. So at this time, uh, you know, I alluded to the miasma theory earlier. There was a good deal of skepticism for uh, you know, skepticism about the idea of contagious disease. Uh, one theory that was popular at the time was the miasma theory. Uh, it was the idea that disease was transmitted through bad poisoned air. Uh, this would be employed greatly during the cholera outbreak in London during the 1850s. Uh, it was proven or disproven uh, mainly by the work of John Snow, which really was an epidemiologic study looking at the cases of cholera, you know, looking at them on a map and sort of following where the outbreaks were occurring, uh, he was able to disprove uh, the miasma theory to a great, great degree. But it was easy for people at this time to believe this because, you know, there was a reluctance to accept any sort of fecal oral route. Uh, there was a, a they, they were sort of reinforced to look down upon you know, people that lived in slums, they smelled bad, the area smelled bad, and so this idea was very popular that disease was not, uh, disease was not thanks to microbes and, you know, you know, sort of infectious agents. It was actually just a result of putrefaction and the bad air and the filth uh, associated with it. It wasn't until uh, Joseph Lister's theories came out uh, that, and really, and Pasteur as well, uh, that people began to look closer at the idea of germ theory. Uh, in 1860, uh, Lister became a professor of surgery at Glasgow. Uh, he became mainly interested in the dramatic differences between open and closed fractures. At this time, if you had a closed fracture, uh, you know, you had a high likelihood of achieving union of the bone and achieving this without any significant morbidity or, or mortality. Open fractures, on the other hand, even small openings, uh, they most often went to separation and infection, uh, and usually this wound up uh, necessitating amputation. And again, at this time, the amputation rate of mortality was about 50%. And so this made him very interested. Uh, he began uh, le learning about Pasteur and germ theory. Uh, Lister was pretty quick to begin working with ideas uh, to uh, try to curb uh, infection. Uh, he chose uh, carbolic acid, uh, which is phenol. He selected that initially. It was used at this time to sanitize sewage, and so he thought that that would be a good chemical to use. Uh, and by the end of 1867, uh, he reported a decrease in mortality from 50% to 15%. Over the next two years, he would say that he could get his mortality rate down to around 5%. The <clears throat> landmark paper uh, that uh, he shared his results with, uh, with the world, uh, was published in The Lancet uh, in the spring of 1867. The Lancet uh, decided to divide this into five parts, and it really, considering the, uh, the, real, the real important subject of the paper, the title is kind of uh, cumbersome. Uh, but it basically was a step-by-step -step, uh, presentation of 11 cases of open fractures, uh, including the 11-year-old uh, James Greenless, uh, who was uh, run over by a cart and had an open fracture and 
uh, at this time, he essentially would have had uh, the standard uh, progression of events, uh, wound infection, separation, amputation, and then a 50% mortality risk. Uh, Lister initially irrigated these wounds and dressed them with uh, carbolic acid soaked uh, dressings and he reported no cases of infection uh, and actually reported that his patients did well and their fractures were able to heal. This uh, really led him on to a, uh, a period of time where he did a lot of traveling lectureships. Uh, he coined the term antiseptic principle uh, later that year while he was in Dublin. Uh, he, by this point, was able to sort of, he, he sort of focused on that as being the hallmark uh, idea from his papers, and so that was presented as a principle. Uh, but still, uh, his work was accepted by some and criticized by others. This is a, this is a paper, a replication paper that was put out uh, actually by Lister's father-in-law, who was the uh, surgeon to the Queen of Scotland at the time, and he put out a similar paper in support of Lister's, but there was actually a good deal of scrutiny and a, a good deal of people who frankly said, as, as uh, James Young Simpson said, uh, these have been, these results have already been obtained using acupressure. Uh, this is an old reprehensible system, not in any way original. Uh, Basically, the theory that Pasteur, upon which Lister bases his treatments, is unsound. A lot of people were very critical. Uh, a lot of people did not uh, did not uh, uptake any sort of ideas of antisepsis for quite some time, and it was actually interesting how long the period of time was between uh, the widespread acceptance of antisepsis and its presentation. It was actually a very long gap. Uh, but during this time, Lister pressed on. Uh, he ultimately got to the point to where he soaked everything uh, in carbolic acid. He later would uh, experiment with different other chemicals, uh, such as chloride of lime and uh, salicylic acid. Uh, these are some pictures here. One is, this is a atomizer or a sprayer. Uh, phenol was essentially sprayed uh, pretty much everywhere. Initially it was sprayed as mainly a liquid type form all over the wound. It, the wounds were irrigated with it. Eventually, as Lister did uh, believe in the atmospheric transmission of disease, eventually he made atomizers. Uh, he and several other, other physicians made atomizers and they would essentially create a fog in the room of phenol. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is not an old picture. This is from a ship television, but uh, beards were dipped in phenol, uh, dressings were soaked in it, uh, they continued on. And the, op the, the opposition during this time criticized a lot of what they were doing. Uh, they, you know, germ theory wasn't accepted, uh, there was added cost, added time. Uh, many surgeons, uh, you know, basically stated that no one else can replicate this, so it must not be true. Uh, and then Lister changing agents, that was seen as doubt uh, in his theory and in his practice. And another, another thing, which is actually a, just a practical point, uh, this was a very abrasive, abrasive and corrosive agent. Uh, you know, operating in a cloud of phenol uh, was not uh, something that was seen as, as a beneficial uh, for the health of the surgeon or for the patient. And so there was a lot of criticism. But... <coughs> Antisepsis would ultimately catch on. Uh, really, in, in Eastern Europe and Austria and Germany, uh, antisepsis caught on pretty quickly. Uh, they began to experiment with other chemicals. Uh, Volkmann in Germany adopted antisepsis in 72, 1872. Uh, he actually would go on and speak of, in support of it in London in 1881 in a pretty key address. Uh, as as England and America held out longer than Eastern Europe. Uh, Theodore Billroth uh, adopted antiseptic technique uh, reportedly as a favor to Volkmann. Uh, they were friends and he, he initially did not uh, put a lot of faith in it, but he did this as a favor and ultimately he would become convinced. Uh, by the 1880s, most people in the UK and in America had adopted the antiseptic technique. So I don't have a lot of time. I was going to quickly just sort of wrap this up. But after this, uh, the discovery of specific microbes causing specific diseases was uh, 
you know, this was something that was uh, done in 1878 by uh, by Robert Koch. Uh, from here, uh, antisept or the aseptic technique was born. Uh, at this point, uh, direct contact and direct inoculation were discovered. Uh, atmospheric transmission of disease was uh, sort of disproven. Uh, this is an article in a German paper, uh, basically stating away with the spray. Uh, carbolic acid atomizers were done away with, sprays were done away with. In pretty rapid period of time, uh, steam sterilizers or autoclaves were, cre uh, were created, uh, rubber gloves uh, such as this glove that was used in Halstead's operating room, uh, they became popular. Uh, and operating rooms changed, uh, non-porous surfaces, tiles, uh, things that could be sterilized and sanitized easily. Uh, wood was done away with, uh, cracks and crevices were done away with, uh, smooth surfaces became uh, the, new, the new vogue in surgery. Hospitals were created with uh, surgery in mind. Uh, you saw uh, this is a uh, operative suite uh, that would later be used by uh, McBurney. Uh, 1891, you saw special operating rooms for septic cases, special cases, you had an amphitheater for uh, dissection, sterilization. So hospitals were actually designing operating rooms with surgery in mind uh, based on the findings from, you know, the fields of anesthesia and antisepsis and later asepsis. So what we've seen is, you know, in a period, a pretty rapid period of about 60 years, uh, the the environment on which operations was performed uh, changed very rapidly and by the end of the 19th century uh, you wound up at a picture like this which is uh, Dr. McBurney operating uh, in around 1900 or 1901 and so you can see uh, no caps yet, caps and masks would be added later but uh, clean garbs uh, new clothes every day before every case, non-porous structures, non-porous floor, tile, walls. So essentially over this period, uh, we were able to arrive at what could be considered a modern op operating room. These are my references, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Questions, comments uh, from Coke? I had uh, a couple of observations myself. Uh, couldn't help but note Bill Ross' uh, early quote there about uh, that, you know, that, that poor people were the only ones operated on in hospitals. Mm -hmm. There's an argument uh, in Philadelphia about what was really the oldest hospital in the country because Penn, Pennsylvania Hospital claims to be the hospital. But Philadelphia General Hospital was probably it because it was an almshouse. Mm -hmm. And only poor people lived there. And so they operated on people uh, there probably before any other place. So it wasn't a hospital as such, but they used it effectively as that. Then it gradually became uh, a hospital uh, converting from an almshouse, which was a poor house, uh, uh, to a hospital. But it's an academic discussion, I guess, because PGH, of course, has been closed for a long time, but that was that was one. Then the other thing, looking at the tables there, I couldn't help but think about people like Dr. Smith and myself. You saw Halstead bending over his, this was the first operation in his OR. Yes, with, sir. With a non-adjustable table. Uh, that, that would have been <laughs> pretty miserable to do, it would seem to me. Uh, other comments from folks, observations? Well, that was a very scholarly presentation, as always, John. We appreciate that. It was really good. You want to make any thank comments, you. any further comments? Uh, well, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone. Uh, sorry I had to rush through that. I was worried I would go way over time. But, you didn't um, go over. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. But, yeah, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to everyone today. And I'll, I'm sure I'll speak more tonight. And thank a lot more other people, but I'll let everything get going this morning. Thank you again.
Well, I mentioned earlier that uh, this was the 27th Augustus McCravey lecture, and I, most, uh, I, as many of you have heard me say before, it always annoys me that I go to a named lectureship and have no idea who the person was for which it's named, and so uh, typically I try to remind everybody who Augustus McCravey was and tell you a little bit about him because he was a, a special individual uh, and uh, and what his family's done in his community has been special. Uh, so this is, though, the 27th uh, one that we have, and this is a picture of Dr. McCravey uh, during his uh, time as a function, as a practicing neurosurgeon here. Uh, he was born <coughs> in Flintstone, Georgia. This is a, a, a house close to the railroad that his family, or a, I'm sorry, a store that close to the railroad that his family had he also had a farm. He was born in a shed, actually, behind that in 1910. Was the first graduate, uh, actually the first person in his, in his family to go to college. Went to the University of Georgia uh, and remained, by the way, a, an avid uh, fan of Georgia um, uh, up until th through his death, uh, actually. Um, went to a lot of the football games uh, and was very proud of that. He graduated from medical school at MCG in, at the age of 24 in 1934. Uh, came here to Erlanger and did an internship, uh, which was really pretty much all that was available at that time uh, in the mid-30s, and then went on to Temple in Philadelphia to do uh, what was a very novel uh, training at that time in neurosurgery. Uh, of course, a lot of surgery as well. Then went in the Army um, uh, and on the eve of, uh, of the attack on Pearl Harbor, he and a nurse that he had met while in the Army at Fort Bragg uh, married Helen Wills. Um, and uh, she was an Army nurse uh, and he an Army surgeon. Then he ended up in the European theater uh, doing uh, surgical procedures, especially neurosurgical procedures. And then after that, came back to Chattanooga where he was a, a leader in the local uh, community uh, in every respect, but also on a regional level was the president of the Southern Neurosurgical uh, Association. Uh, and, and actually they have a, a distinguished service honor in his name. But he did a lot of things here. He was dis discussing brain injury here and he helped establish uh, some of the centers for disabled children here. He was on the board of trustees at Erlanger uh, and then along the way, he and his wife that you see there on the right um, had two children, the woman in the middle, Martha McCravey, and then the one on the far left, John. Uh, John couldn't be here today. He's out of town, but I uh, wanted to wish everyone well. He's pretty much always here for this presentation. Everybody knows he is a practicing uh, medical oncologist here uh, after spending time up at uh, Sloan Kettering for a good long while. Uh, the, the young man in the middle um, is Alan Hyde, who is the uh, husband of Martha, and he is a, an orthopedic surgeon. And Alan and Martha live in in uh, in Washington State uh, and practice there still. Um, so it was a medical family. Mrs. McCravey was very much a leader in civic activities and things like that here as well. Uh, in his extra time, Dr. McCravey was also remained, remained a farmer, and I always show the picture of the Hereford Bull with him and the grandchild behind it. Uh, when I first came to Chattanooga, he came up to me and said, you know, I've got a problem. And I said, what could that be? I mean, I, he was a renowned surgeon, and he said, well, I built into the requirements in our group that when you get to be 65, you have to stop working. And he said, I'm not ready to stop working, so you need to find something for me to do. And so we had a neurosurgery clinic at the time, uh, and from that point until his uh, death later on from metastatic prostate cancer, uh, he attended that clinic, worked with our residents, and if we ever had a problem getting one of our staff neurosurgeons to take care of a patient, he, he saw to it that that person came and did it because he, of course, established the neurosurgical group here uh, that still that now lately has become employees of the hospital but existed until just a year and a half or two years ago as an independent practice. So he was very dedicated to that and I have to just tell you all a side story since John saved me a little time. <clears throat> From that point forward, 
as most of you know in this in our program here we have used a lot of surgeons uh, when they're ready to retire if they want to keep on coming to the hospital and doing something we've used them in our program in many respect in many ways uh, giving medical student lectures as well as attending in the clinic somebody got me in a conversation about this about three or four years ago at the college of surgeons and Two years ago, three years ago, they came up to me and said, you're going to be the chairman of a new committee. And I said, I don't think I need to be a chairman of a new committee. Yeah, you do, because you have experience with this. And it is what now has become a pretty significant issue at the, at the college. It's, I want to call it transitions to retirement, but they want to call it coaching the next generation. And it's a group of more senior level surgeons around the country and we're trying to wrestle with things that we can do to uh, promote education, passing on mentorship to uh, our colleagues, uh, and but more than anything in my mind is provide an opportunity for that retiring surgeon to still feel worth because as many of you have heard me say before, what you are is a surgeon, you become that. Uh, you may be a father, dad, or even a cattleman on the side, but more than anything, you are a surgeon, and you hate to take that away from somebody uh, just because of age. Uh, so anyway, that has become, uh, I always credit Dr. McCravey as being in part responsible for the fact that that movement has occurred at the American College of Surgeons. So anyway, he would always come back. This is him actually at one of these meetings where we had a, a folks come back and we presented papers from our residents. Uh, see Dr. Greer there talking about this is Gary Gropper somebody he was particularly proud of because Gary became a neurosurgeon still is practicing neurosurgeon in Atlanta uh, this is I will show this picture though this is John and Mrs. McCravey because Dr. McCravey did not give the money for the uh, Augustus McCravey lecture Mrs. McCravey and John did uh, at his death and so we really appreciate the fact that they did that she was a she was a very forceful wonderful lady uh, but she didn't mind telling you what she thought and she would come to these lectures she came I think that the only two she missed while she was alive were the last two when she became somewhat disabled but she would always critique them to me then uh, later in the day but I thought that was pretty good or I didn't think that was very good at all this was one actually it was a friend of hers and Dr. McCravey he was one of the first lecturers he was a neurosurgeon and as nice as she seems to him there, she got me aside that night and said, don't ever invite anybody like that again. I said, just because he knew Gus, said, he really wasn't very good. So let's get somebody that can give a good talk. Uh, and this is her again at the social function in the evening uh, and with uh, Harry Stone, who was wonderful about going by and picking her up. So uh, there's somebody that uh, really meant a lot to us and continues to mean a lot to us um, as, as time goes by. And uh, so the McCravey family are people that we remember and appreciate. Now, <clears throat> we've had, uh, we have a whole list of slides of the people that have presented this lecture, but uh, Maggie got this together for us, just the last few, because most of these people are folks that our speaker, Dr. Meredith, knows. Uh, Grace Rosicki, Dave Richardson, L.D. Britt, all very close friends and, and colleagues with, with Dr. Meredith. Uh, those were back uh, for three years. And then the most recent three here, you see Kirby Bland, also a good friend of uh, Wayne and mine, uh, and Scott Jones, who's been a mentor and friend of ours. And then there's John Horgan. Who is that? Well, he's a graduate of our program who, I was telling Wayne this story yesterday, this happened to us a couple of times where our scheduled speaker got sick uh, and we had to run somebody in off the bench. And John Horgan, uh, Scott Jones was scheduled to come in 2014 and had a ruptured appendix on Sunday, called me on Monday and said, I still think I'll be there. But by Thursday they were doing an open uh, lysis of adhesions for small, small bowel obstruction. So we called John on Thursday night and he came and gave the McCravey lecture this Saturday. So we appreciated him doing that. But just shows you how well trained people are here, at Wayne. Uh, just give you an idea. Uh, Wayne Meredith uh, has been a good friend of mine for a long time. One of the things that's particularly notable about Wayne uh, is that his education and his training centers around uh, one institution. 
uh, Wake Forest uh, University uh, for the most part. He did leave and do some training other places, but fairly briefly. Uh, and you see the North Carolina Baptist Hospital, that's just the, that's the hospital in which Wake Forest, formerly Bowman Gray Medical School, uh, medical students and residents uh, worked. Uh, but he trained in general surgery, did a trauma fellowship, and then also did a thoracic surgery fellowship. So he's uh, got multiple board uh, credentialing. Uh, he's, he's, so far as I know, never been on the faculty anywhere except at Wake Forest, and has been the chairman there now for many years. Uh, he's done a lot of other things along the way that you can see, but most of them have been there. Uh, you notice he was the program director, uh, and earlier I mentioned that he has been succeeded as a program director by our Amy Hildreth, who, whom we're very proud of. Now, his, his uh, activities as a surgeon are what he's probably most proud of, but he also is a, a regional and national leader uh, in, and, a, and a thought leader, I might add, uh, in medicine and surgery, and these are just a list of the organizations that he's been president of, uh, the Southeastern, uh, the East Organization in Trauma, the AAST, very prestigious, uh, the, the American Trauma Society, the Southern Surgical, and the Halstead Society. So he's somebody that we have great respect for. He also served for a long time as chairman of the Committee on Trauma for the American College of Surgeons, and as most of you know, that is a very influential group in terms of, uh, of, of changes in trauma care around the country. Uh, these are just some of the editorial boards and things like that that he's served on. So he's really been a star. He's a mentor to people. He's a role model to medical students. Uh, he's an academic surgeon, but he's really a surgeon, and, and more than anything, that's the thing that, that he likes to do. So Wayne is a really good friend. He's somebody we honor greatly. We're really happy to have him and his wife Gail here visiting with us, and so I'm pleased to introduce to you Wayne Meredith. We could get somebody to come and get your slides up, I guess. Can you? Sure. Can I borrow your lavalier microphone? Yes, you sure can. In case can. I move around? I want you to. We'll figure this out in no time. There you go. We're good, John. Phil, Dr. Burns, thank you so much. For both for the invitation to be here and for serving as a mentor for me for so many years. I've known about him for a long time and I have admired it greatly, both from afar and close from, from near. Um, a, a lot of it's through the trauma world, back, Don Barker, now Bob Maxwell, but to lately um, through you're one of your graduates, Amy Hildreth, who is just one of the finest surgeons and finest human beings I know. And uh, it shows the kind of, the caliber of your graduates that come from this program. And um, it's, a, it's a, something that all of you really need to be, deserve to be proud of and need to be proud of. So I, I'm gonna, uh, this is a little bit of a different kind of a lecture now, so you, kinda, you might want to loosen up a little. <laughs> it's, not, it's not going to be one of these formal lectures that talks about the history of vascular trauma or something like that. It, I call it Lessons Learned on the Way to the Operating Room, and I, I really have put together some advice for the graduating residents, I figure this is a graduating residence um, type lecture for a group of graduating residents, and it is the and it is things that I tell people all the time that are asking me for advice. Our residents, our medical students, our junior faculty, so many senior faculty around the country, and so wander with me through some of this, and I will I will promise you, even though it seems like I'm going off track down some little side story, because I'm really prone to go off track down some little side story, I will get right back on the interstate before long. So you're now heading out, you're finishing your residency, and you're just like my son here, I think I can. You're, you you're, don't know exactly what's going to happen. 
So it, life changes. Trust your training. Let me tell you this story. My dad, I'll tell you more about my dad in a minute. But I, one day he went to the, he got started having belly pain. He went to the emergency room and uh, I did all the work up. I wasn't doing it. I was just kind of in the background orchestrating it, making sure the right people were the right were there. And uh, but anyway, last week, he's now 94 years old. Um, last week, he and I gave a lecture together. And during that lecture, he said, you know, back however long ago it was, my son came in, he sat down, and he said something to me I never said in my 50 years of practice. He said to me, you have appendicitis. <laughs> In his entire practice, he never said those words. He said, you might have appendicitis. We think you have appendicitis. You probably have appendicitis. We're going to have to operate on you to see if you have appendicitis. But he never, he never had the luxury of getting a CAT scan and being able to tell a patient, you have appendicitis. And when I said those words to him, it struck him as bold and bizarre and, 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 and amazing. So you... you are embarking on a career in surgery that is going to be changing your whole life. But there are some principles that won't, and I want to try to impart a few of those, and just a few words of wisdom and maybe a little bit of humor. This is that guy. This is my dad. Um, he hit the sweet spot in medicine, in my opinion, right? He started practicing right after they invented antibiotics, and he quit right after they invented managed care. He nailed it. And he enjoyed surgery every day of his life. And I, I, I want you to enjoy surgery every day of your life. I'll tell you way more about that later. He was an amazing guy. He grew up in the Depression in the hills of Virginia, in deep Appalachia. Fought in both the European and Pacific theaters of the war. He was an airborne infantry. You don't meet a lot of these guys that were glider infantrymen in the glider force in World War II because the lot, most of them didn't make it back out. He was an innovative guy. He started our burn unit. He started our transplant program. He was a founder in the CEOP, which ultimately became UNOS. He began doing open bariatric surgery when I was a resident. He served for 37 years as chair of the North Carolina Board of Health and was the first person to ever successfully replant a hand in the, in the country. Just as an aside, just to tell you the kind of guy he is, we were sitting around the dinner table one evening, and my mom said, you know, I saw Time Magazine. It has a guy with your name in it. It did something cool. And he said, oh, yeah, it was me. <laughs> uh, so just an innovative guy. So you and he, as I, as I listen to talk to him, he's so wise, and he's done so many things, and he's been such an innovator it dawns on me that you are embarking on a career, much like when he embarked on a career, much like when I embarked on a career, that you have no idea where it's going to go, but it's going to go someplace great. Keep your eyes open and watch for it. I show this slide to talk about th times of change. So one day I'm making rounds, and I've got this kid, who's, as I recall it, he was in a motorcycle crash, pretty badly torn up. And, we finally got him through it all. He got him out of the ICU. He's on the floor, and his, we're at the bedside, and his dad said, yeah, I was a patient in this hospital when I was a kid. I said, really? He said, yeah, I still got the hospital bill from that. I said, do you really? He said, yeah. I said, let me see it. So he brought it in and showed it to me. This is his hospital bill. 1941. He fell on a tobacco sled. Y'all might know what a tobacco sled is. When I told him about that at Cordell, they did not. Um, but he fell on a tobacco sled and stuck his side with one of those spikes that they used to tie tobacco to. Had a big, I've looked his chart up, had a big mesenteric hematoma and a uh, rent in his mesentery, but no other bowel injuries. And he stayed in the hospital from July 22nd to August 3rd <laughs> for a mesenteric hematoma. And his hospital bill was $48.20. The operating room fee was $10.00. Now, I happen to know that the practice back then of the surgeon, who was probably Henry Valk because of the era that this was, his practice was just to charge him whatever, what the, whatever the hospital bill was. That's what he charged people. So he probably got $48.20 for this operation. At any rate, times have changed a lot. Prepare yourself for that. And here's the first piece of advice on that. Learn to do surgery. Don't learn to do operations. So many people learn to do ulcer operation. And, I, and our colleagues, I know a lot of people learn to do 
you know, the main operations, which was uh, total vaginal hysterectomy, ligation of the right ureter, ligation of the left ureter, and and learning just to do operations is not is 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 not good. Learning to do surgery because the principles of surgery and being someone who's learned to manage surgical diseases will change throughout your career. When I was doing, when I was training, this is this is years after my father and the the people of that generation trained. When I started, the debate was Kefsol or Keflin, right? We had no we had no cimetidine. I'm not old. I'm young. We we had no tagamet. Uh, everybody that had an ulcer just about got operated on eventually. Uh, we had no CT scans. Um, all of that has changed just in my surgical lifetime. But the things that have not changed in my surgical lifetime are, are, are timeless. The way that spleen's still on the left, right? Some clavin vein still joins up the, with the jugular vein, forms the innominate vein. All those things are exactly the same. All the tissue planes are exactly the same. Surgical diseases grow and move and change, but we learn more about them. But the way surgery gets done is still the same, and it's not going to change. Most residents are not exposed to that many true general surgeons. I would say my father was one of those true general surgeons. He described a general surgeon as a surgeon who operates on the skin and its contents. Uh, he, he also, I would have to say, was what, what I call a hand surgeon, which means he would operate on anything he could get his hands on. But most residents now are not exposed to good role models in general surgery. And I want to employ you throughout your life to remember those role models that you have seen who are true general surgeons. Remember what that is like and the extent possible be that role model for the younger people who come along and give you an opportunity to, to do that. Um, it, it, it is um, the way to learn and know the principles across surgery. And though more and more people are learning those by trying to sum up the sum of the parts of each of the silos, which is which is possible to build a wall by putting lots of silos side by side. It's way better to build that wall in rows of, of solid foundation of brick and build a really strong structure. That's how you need to have been learning that. And from every evidence that I can see, the people in this residency program learn that way. It's not as common as you might think. Learn to do surgery, not just operations. These are things that I learned from my father's greatest generation. I'll back it up. Learn to do surgery, not just operations. Do your duty. This is just characterizes those people. You are accountable for your patient. Make a contribution to the world around you. And make a commitment to a safe, reliable patient experience. Um, um, I'll... Um, I'll divert a little bit before I come back to some of those. And I may never get back to them, so just. Um, this is a story about, about Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey writes these business books t telling people about one-minute manager and all this stuff. And he, he tells a story about teaching a business school class where he puts a big jar, a mason jar in his case, on the desk, and he starts putting rocks in it, and he fills it up. And he gets it totally full, and he asks this class, is this jar full? Of course, they say, yep, it's full. And he says, not, not so fast. I can put some gravel in it. And he puts some gravel in it, shakes it around, and before long, he, he gets it, puts some gravel in it, is it full? Put some sand in it, is it full? Put some water in it, is it full? And they all see this, and they learn, and he says, so what's the point? What am I trying to teach you here? What's the lesson from this? And, and, there's, and the, these hotshot business students, just like hotshot medical students, just like surgery residents would say, um, you can always do more. If you just look and you work hard enough and you try to figure out a way, you can always get a little bit more done. You can always put a little more in your day. You can always do a little bit. And Covey said, no, that's not the right lesson. The lesson is you have to put the big rocks in first. And so as you are working now, starting to build your life, starting to build your career, you have to put the big rocks in first. I carry these little stones around with me all the time. And I tell this story often to young people, and I'll then hand them one of these stones and tell them, you have to decide what the big rocks are for you, but I want you to carry this stone and remember it. God, family, your own health, you got to start with that. 
but you also in your everyday work you have to make sure that you're spending the time to work on the big projects on the different makers you have to pay a little bit of attention to make sure that the tyranny of the urgent does not keep you from working on the important and that's a really hard discipline to maintain throughout a lifetime and throughout a career but those people who do that make a big difference in the world they make a big difference in the world because they take on big problems. You know, I, I one time, one of the guys I most admired was a guy named Doug Maynard. He was our chief of radiology when I was young. He did a lot of stuff, and, I, and he and I did a lot of stuff together. He's way older than I was, but we helped start a school for biomedical engineering between Wake Forest and Virginia Tech. It is just an amazing thing now. And he was sort of the brainchild behind that, and I was just sort of the workhorse behind it. But... Um, one day I was in his office and I got Paige and I went to go answer the phone and uh, he lent me his phone behind his desk and I and, and I went to dial on it and I realized he had this one of these you know these big paper clip things that people have that for for you put something in it had a three by five card in it. it had the it had the year right like 1999 the year on the top it had four bullet points and those are the four things he was going to concentrate on all year and every year he makes a new card he puts it right there on his phone he looks at it all day every day multiple times every day and it's his way of making sure that when that phone rings or when the person calls and says can you come look at this x-ray with me or when some little kid like me comes along and says can you help me write this paper or something you got to keep an eye on what are the big projects what are the important things I'll tell you one more story about this. I might get choked up, but I'll tell you one more story about this. There's a guy named Nito Quibane who, who lives near us. He's, he's the head of High Point University. I'll tell you two stories about Nito Quibane. See how, how wandering this can go. But Nito Quibane tells, is a, has a great quote that actually applies to residents. He says, he says, there are many important days in your life, but I'll tell you two of them that are really important. The first one is the day you're born, and the second one is the day you realize why. Right today, you figure out what you were born to do, why you're there. For us, that's surgery, right? I was born to be a surgeon. I didn't know it till way late. Didn't know it till I was in medical school. But I was born to be a surgeon. You're probably born to be a surgeon and didn't know it. That's Nito Quibane. Also, I got to know him because my daughter went to High Point University, and she was there when she did a summer school thing. At any rate, um, she wanted to see this new dormitory, and so she got on the internet and she looked up people in the administrative building and 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 found the phone number and called to to this administrative number to see if she could get a chance to look at this uh, new dormitory. Well, the number she got was the president of the university, Nito Quibay, and he said, "Come to my office, I'll take you around." So, in the middle of his day, this freshman student calls him up, asks him for a favor. He stops, takes 30, 45 minutes walking around, shows her this new dormitory. I heard about this and I realized, you know, in the middle of my day, 45 minutes, a student comes along and just harvests 45 minutes out of the middle of my day. I'm screwed. <laughs> I'm ruined. This day's going to be a disaster. And I learned from him, and I asked him about this later. We were at a fundraiser together, and he, and he said something similar to you have to put the big rocks in first. He says, you know, th this university is about those students. If I don't do what they need every time, if every decision I make is not about what the students need and what's best for those students, then I'm not doing my job. I would now call that I'm not putting the big rocks in first. And so as you're building your practice, think about it like that. Make sure your practice is practicing ethically. Make sure you're hiring people that are going to be like you, that will work hard and will take care of patients first and they're not going to do all the things that get people off track on. Put the big rocks in first and build your new life by making sure you do those things right. Please avoid insatiable desires. I know so many people who are trying to be successful and they have an insatiable desire to be president of the American College of Surgeons or insatiable desire to have a big house in the Bahamas. Or, But trust me, I've looked it up. Insatiable desire. Insatiable means you can't satisfy it. 
<laughs> These insatiable desires are not traits of happy people. Happy people who have fulfilling lives have satiable desires. They do not clutter their minds with these insatiable ones. So keep high goals but attainable goals and celebrate achieving them and look for more. But don't set out yourself out to have the insatiable desires. Always touch the place that hurts. You know, it's really easy now to sit behind a computer and listen to the patient go tut, 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 and sort of I always tease the dermatologist. I, I actually like all kinds of doctors, I, I, but I also like teasing other specialists. I always tease the dermatologist. If they see a rash and they think, if you don't know what it is, don't touch it. <laughs> and if you do, why would you have to? But um, I, Always, I, I, always touch the place that hurts. Patients need to know that you care enough about them that you're paying attention to them and listening. Another, another one of these little ones, and, and, and I'll have some longer ones later. The success that others see in you, that success is actually just a byproduct of doing the things that you love doing. You know, you saw Dr. Burns showed a whole bunch of stuff on the on the slides introducing me, and 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 those are cool things. And lots of my young faculty want to do a lot of those cool things, and they're gratifying, and I've loved doing them. Um, but the um, Distinguished Service Award of College of Surgeons, the president of this or this thing of that. All of those things are byproducts of doing something you love to do. And if you keep it that way, you, you get to do the things that you love to do. You get to make a commitment for a cause in which you believe, or you get to make a commitment to a group of people that you love, or you get to make a contribution to a field that you hold dear. And those commitments and contributions are the reward right and the rest are byproducts of that that other people can see but they can't really see the fulfillment or the joy or the gratification that comes from that so as you are building your career and you're doing those things get engaged in your professional societies um, what, whether you're in an academic program, whether you're in an academic practice, or whether you're in practice, get engaged in some professional societies, your state chapter of the college, Southeastern Surgical, something. Get engaged with other people that are interested in doing what you're doing. Make some contribution to that. And if not there, do it in some part of your life and get those things. Do it in your church. Do it in the scouts. Do it in... Bridge club, I, I, it doesn't, cattle, <laughs> do, it, do it in cattle farming, but make that contribution. Uh, um, looking, looking back on things now, it's the effort th that, may, that has been the pleasure, not the accomplishment along the way of those things. And so as you're starting out, do that. Success others see in you is actually just a byproduct of doing what you love. This one's important. Let patients thank you. Let patients thank you. How many times, how many times have you, you know, fixed that iliac vein is bleeding like crazy and you know how hard that was and, and you finally get them through it and they're getting ready to go home and they, they start saying, oh, thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. You saved my daughter. And you go, oh, nothing, no problem. We do this all the time. Oh, great team. I have a great team. I used to do that all the time. I never do that now. I try to I try to catch myself every time I find myself doing that because you're not listening to your patient if you are dismissing this thank you. They are trying to tell you I don't want to get choked up over it. <laughs> but they're trying to tell you that you have just shepherded them through one of the most important events in their life that they cannot begin to tell you how valuable that is, how much they appreciate it. It was a big deal to them. And it might be a big deal to them because you took a lot of off their back, right? But, you know, if you've just ever had an arthroscopy or had a, something like that done, a heart attack, um, the doctors that come and save you from that, that's a big deal. And so when patients say, thank you, doctor, Take, accept it and say, 
well, thank you for noticing. You know, I, I, it's a it's a joy to get a chance to help people, and I'm really glad that you appreciate it. Or I am I am so glad to get to help you. It's it's what I live for. S acknowledge the fact that they're tr they're trying to tell you something that's profound in their life, and to dismiss it as oh, we do this every day. Oh, it's just a good team is not giving them the gratification they need the, 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 or the um, attention to that important detail that they deserve. So I uh, just encourage you to do that. Let patients thank you. <laughs> All hospitals are outside. How many times are you on rounds or are you in a presentation and they say, uh, Mr. Jones is a you know, 62-year-old man who was referred from an outside hospital? Well, they're all outside. This one's outside. It's not indoors. They're all outside. Every hospital's outside. And I think it is extremely disrespect, disrespectful of your referring physicians to, to treat them, at, to, to describe where they work as an outside hospital. Any hospital outside of our hospital is not that good. They're just an outside hospital. And these are, every one of these docs is working, busting their ass <laughs> and doing the best they can for their patients. Just like you're busting your ass to do the best you can for your patients. And it's, it's a little bit disparaging to, dis, to refer to the work that they do or the place that they do it in a, the pejorative terms like this. I think we should call them all referring hospitals. But it, it's not so much about using the words right, it's about using the concept right. It's, and I, I'll tell you a little bit more about presumption of virtuous intent later because it's important. If your date offers you a breath mint, take it. You never know. It might be because good things are all waiting you. Uh, I'll give you several examples of this. I was walking down, down the halls in the, at the Southern Surgical, actually, and Ted Copeland, who did not take any part in training me, he's just someone who just took a shine to me as someone with potential at the Southeastern Surgical, which Bill Burns got me connected to. And, he, and one day he put his arm around me and he said, you need to be sure and send a paper to the Southern Surgical every year. That's all he said, and I, and I thought, huh, why would so, Ted Copeland was like the, a god in surgery, a chairman of the Board of Regents, so he just, he just, and a super guy. Why on earth would Ted Copeland be telling little old me anything, much less that, and anyway, but I took it to heart, so I always did. And, and, and ultimately, I became the president of the Southern Surgical Association, and I met, knowing what I know now, I know what he was doing. Right? He saw that potential. He saw that what could happen. He's, and, and he knew that the things that could keep it on track and keep it on track. And he couldn't tell me all that. I couldn't have understood it had he told me all that. But he was just telling me that. So, you know, if your date offers you a breath mint, take it. If your chief medical officer comes around and says, you really need to get those charts done, <laughs> he's trying to tell you in a subtle way. You're going to lose your privileges if you don't get off your tail and go do that. <laughs> right? I know, uh, you know, our, our, our Chief CNA, CRNA came, came to me and said, y you need to go into the pump room and talk to this nurse, but not the, not the, the cardiac perfusion room, the room where they keep the cardiac bypass pumps, the perf perfusionist room, and talk to the nurse that you just finished operating with. It's, it's, it's you know, midnight or something. And so I, I went to talk to her, and it turns out we'd been working like crazy. Uh, uh, as I remembered, it was sewing up a big old crack in the liver, and I'm trying to get all these bleeders stopped and putting in the stitches. And she's not handing me those sutures in time. And I, I said, you know, if you can't hand me a suture as fast as I can put it in and tie it, this man's going to die. And I didn't mean that as in a blameful way. I just thought it was informative <laughs> of the situation we're in. But, you know, if, if Patty Petrie had not come along and said, you need to go talk to this nurse, we were also a great nurse. And she turns out to be one of our best scrub nurses even today. But she was, she was in tears. She was going to quit. She was, it was terrible. I, didn't, I had no clue. I had no clue that any of that was going on. I was just trying to, you know, get the blood bank to keep up with us. But if your date offers you a breath mint, take it. People give you a piece of advice. Seems like something for free. Stop and think through what that might be because they may be trying to do away for you. Respect your referring physicians. I must put that in twice. Find the escape key. Listen with your eyes. 
when you're talking to your patient, we always listen with our ears, but they need us to listen with our eyes. They need us to face them and listen to them and not just clickety-clack on the computer. Listen with your eyes and touch the place that hurts. I, tell, I use this advice way more often than with patients, though, about your family. And I learned it from a guy named Wayne Sotil. He and his wife, Gail, and he and his wife, Mary uh, Sotil, are um, medical or specialize in medical marriages and they write about this for the for the JAMA and they they are alumni of the Wake Forest University and so they come and speak at our alumni association stuff a lot and um, Wayne says it like this he says listen with your eyes is not that hard but it's real important imagine this you're sitting there and your and your son comes by and he's playing with his little car you know he's running around and, and you're reading the newspaper and he says, Daddy, Daddy, look at my car. And you go, yeah, that's cool. Man, it's great. He's boom, boom, boom. Yep, that's great. Right? You're listening, but you're not listening with your eyes. The other way to do that is you're reading your newspaper, and he says, Daddy, Daddy, look at my car. And you go, hey, that's a cool car. Cool. I had one like that when I was a kid. Go play. Right? <laughs> it takes no more time, but you stop that one moment. My whole life, this, this is just my whole life, Married, my whole married life, I've picked a place on the way home in our house previous to this one. It was an old oak tree. The house on, on this one, it's a, it's a bench on the corner of a it's stone on the corner of the um, road that I turned down right before I turned up into my house. And that little sign was a reminder to me that I've done every day. The first thing I do when I walk in my house, I don't take off my coat. I don't put down my briefcase. I don't go get a drink. I go find my wife wherever she is in the house. Give her a hug, tell her, ask her how her day was, right? She, it turns out she's not that interested in talking to me most of the time, and I get to go sit down and have a drink. <laughs> and that's a good thing, because that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> but I get a chance to go listen with my eyes. I get a chance to, with my body language, let her know and make it feel to her like I spent all day waiting to get a chance to see her, right? And, and it and it and it feels like that. And it's listening with your eyes. You you. It is a it is a very easy skill to learn, and is a very important skill to learn. With the time pressure on your life is going to be tremendous. The ability to stack those minutes, as I described earlier, the tyranny of the urgent makes it so that you want desperately to, to multitask every minute of it. But it's just not the same to send a text in the middle of the day, which is a great thing to do, let them know you're doing, as it is to look them in the eye and say, I love you, I've been thinking about you all day, or what's up, what's on your mind, or whatever it is that your little code thing that says it, listen with your eyes is important. Live on last year's salary, not on next year's salary. If you can start this habit today as you're getting ready to get out, you have no idea how valuable that will be. We got married and, and uh, I was in medical school. We were living on $600 a month that, that Gail was making at a public relations firm or the public relations section of a firm. And then finally I got a real job and I got paid $10,000 a year. And we, we lived one more year on $600 a month same house, same expense ratio, all that. And we saved the $5,000 difference. And that's, that's in the bank. And it's been growing ever since. And then the next year I got paid ten five, And then we saved that $500. And all it ever cost us, every year along the way. So, and, 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 and some of the years, like the year between the, my last year of fellowship and my first year of practice, pretty good little bump there. <laughs> and, and, and some of the other years along the way, that pretty good little bumps. And we've always lived on that year before. We've always saved that difference. And that money, you won't believe what that will do for yourself over time. It will also set your living expectations at one level lower, which determines when you can retire and with what grace you can retire. If you've lived your whole life at the, what you made last year, not what you're going to make next year, you will be able to achieve the amount of nest egg that will allow you to retire when you want to on your own terms. You don't care about that now. I, I really not quite yet ready to care about it myself, but I have enough friends and I have enough insight to realize you're going to think about this someday. Um, anyway, throughout, live on last year's salary, not on next year's salary. 
My dad told me this when I went off to train with Don Trunkey to study trauma, which ultimately became my life's career and passion. He said, when you get there, go slowly. For you, I say, go slowly in your new practice. If you're as good as I think you are, they will figure it out soon enough. Don't push it. Don't do a whipple on your first day, right? If you're as good as I think you are, they will figure it out soon enough. And if you're not, you want it to take as long as possible. <laughs> Go slow. Don't try to jump in. Learn, get your feet in the water. Learn what the program is like. Learn how people do things. Ask for help. I didn't write this down, but it's, it's, a, it's an axiom of our program. Asking for help is a sign of wisdom, not a sign of weakness. It's a really good way to live your life. Um, knowing when you need it, all of those pieces. Asking for help is a sign of wisdom. But at any rate, go slowly to new practice. Let me tell you a little bit about practice. This is something people don't quite understand. It, it's the only little bit of business that I'm going to do. But a surgery practice, very basically, is a small business. Now, if, 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 if in, in most small businesses or types of businesses, you have fixed costs. That, that's, that's what it costs you to run your business. So if you're a candy store, candy factory, that's the factory. Um, that's your fixed labor cost. And what, what the revenue you have depends on how many pieces of candy you sell. The revenue we have depends on how many operations we do, how many RVUs, how many consults, whatever. But it's all basically sell a shoe, make a shoe, sell a shoe, make a shoe, sell a shoe. So in the candy store, you have the fixed cost and then the variable cost. Each piece of candy has a certain amount of sugar in it, has a certain amount of other flavorings and stuff in it. And for most businesses, these lines go up like this. Right, because the variable costs are quite a bit more. We have almost no variable costs in the in the way we practice surgery. We're not buying operating rooms. We're not buying staplers or sutures. We have very low. so our fixed our variable costs, our total costs are very much like our fixed costs. Well, where'd I go? I want to skip some of that. But so this helps you understand some things. If if your fixed costs. If your um, variable costs go up, if your fixed costs go up, it goes from here to here. The variable costs stay there. Now, what you take home is this, right? The difference between what comes in and what you spend out in your fixed plus variable costs. So this is what happens when you have higher fixed costs. And the fixed costs in medicine are going up fast. This is what happens when revenue goes down. This line gets strong. down. That's happening too, right? Everywhere we turn, that's happening too. This is what happens if you cut back on your practice. If you work in practice on your own, on pro fees, if you cut back in practice, you move from here to here. It's a way bigger difference than how the amount of fixed costs go up or the amount we get paid goes down. It works like this. Let's say, I'm going to just pick a number because they're easy to work with, not that they're realistic necessarily numbers or even, and they're sort of not your goals. Let's say you're collecting half a million dollars a year. Your expenses in surgery are going to be about half of that. Running, a, running an office, of, in, across your office, you're going to pay about half your expenses and half your collections and expenses. It might be 45%, it might be 52%, but it's not going to be 20, and it shouldn't be 80. So you're going to take on 250000 after you pay your fixed and variable costs. If you say you're going to cut your work back 10%, you're going to collect $450,000 instead of $500,000. Your expenses are going to be exactly the same because our variable costs are so low. It's almost all fixed cost business. So you're going to take on two hundred k. You cut back your work 10%. You cut back your pay 20%. You can't escape these numbers. It's almost impossible working for yourself. It's forcing a lot of people to work for practices, big, bigger practices, to work for hospitals and some other things. But you need to know if you're if you're late in your practice and you want to slow down, if you slow down half, you, you take home no money. You just cover your expenses, right? If you work half time, you're just going to cover your expenses. If you bring in a new partner and that new partner takes 10% of your work, this is going to happen. It's going to take 20% of your pay away. Unless that new partner can add can do it without taking away that amount of work. That's, forced, that's, that's one of the reasons so many people do fellowships, because the new partners want to bring in somebody new that does bariatrics or vascular, something they don't do. So you don't take my gallbladders and hernias from me, right? 
Uh, if you do job sharing, if you want to increase your home responsibilities, uh, if if um, the work is reduced by the government, any of these things, this these are these are these are hard and fast arithmetic numbers. They're not they have no morality associated with them. All right, how to be happy in your life? There, I'll give you three tips. The first is try to live with the presumption of virtuous intent. By that I mean, when when you when you go to when you go to see that patient and they're wheeling them off to X-ray, and you're thinking, what? Why? Wait, wait, wait! <laughs> that person is not trying to make your day difficult. They really don't even know you exist. <laughs> they're, they're they're trying to do what they're trying to do, and their intent is generally virtuous, unless healthy way to describe it is Mark Twain's quote, and Mark Twain says, um, it is an error to ascribe to malfeasance that which can be reasonably explained by mere incompetence alone. Right? It is an error to ascribe to malfeasance that can, which can be explained by mere incompetence alone. Now I say this not because everybody's intent is virtuous. And there are some people whose intent is not virtuous, and you must be not be so naive as to let them take advantage of you. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when I deal with burnout people, when I deal with disruptive physicians, the first sign of that is a victim's mentality. They always have this attitude that they are being victimized. Listen, you're a doctor for Christ's sake. You are not someone who can be victimized by a ward clerk or a nurse or even a hospital administrator. So the, the thing that drives those people crazy is this. And if you will learn to have this presumption of virtuous intent, the reason to do that is because it relieves us of that burden of why in the world would they do that to me? They are trying to do their job the best way they know, just like we're trying to do our job the best way we know. And relieving ourselves of that little tenth of a second of anger a thousand times a day helps you get through the day a happier, healthier person. So presumption of virtuous intent. Catch the people around you doing something right six times as often as you catch them doing something wrong. There are several reasons for this. The first is the way you get people to change behaviors is to, when they do it right, could show them that it, they've done it right and show them why it's right. They will do anything on earth to then try to please you again a million times. If you just constantly catch people doing something wrong, they're just going to try to hide their mistakes from you. And neither you nor your patients can tolerate them hiding their mistakes from you. They need to bring them to you for help to solve them. So, But that, the main reason I'm talking about this is making your life happy. And you will find if you live your life Every chance you get, you see somebody doing something good. You see somebody doing something right. You see, uh, I, I do this like they bring lunch into us. Catch somebody bringing food down the tray. I say, put a smile on your face. That re you know, you're going to make somebody's day bringing this food in. And they and, and catch them doing something right. And before long, you find you feel good because you're having a positive day. You're seeing lots of good things going right. And you can make your day be finding a hundred things that are going wrong, and they're all there. They're all there. And if you find those hundred things going wrong and you don't see the things going right and you presume and you don't presume virtuous intent, you're gonna burn out. You're gonna burn out way faster than you deserve to over some little thing, one little tiny habits that you can form that make you last. And the last of my three advice is don't forget why you went into this field in the first place. We work in a great field. And, and right now, when you're just full of that vim and vigor and pure wholesomeness of a fresh-born baby, brand new surgery blast, right? You still have the placenta hanging off of you. Now is the time to remember how you feel and how glorious it is and how great it's going to be. And don't, don't lose that feeling. Don't forget about that. You've got to go back to that well because that well is the well that keeps you going for the rest of your career. Cherish and nurture the friendships you have made here in your residency. There's no one else on earth that quite understands exactly what it was like now, this year, for you, the chief residents. The rest of you residents in the room, make a point of it. Gail and I were talking about this on the way over here. 
Residency is fun, actually. I mean, there's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of stuff that's challenging. But it's a great time in your life. It is, it, it, and the friendships that you make in residency should be, need to be, deserve to be permanent. It's not necessarily means you see each other for Christmas every year. Stay in touch with the people you're residents with because these are friendships that just grow deeper and deeper and deeper as time goes on. So I'm going to close with this. What do you think your residency has been worth to you? What do you, what do you think your residency here has been worth to you? It's a great residency. I can tell you I know that because I've, I've hired some of your people and I've met some of your folks. What do you think this residency is worth to you? I'll tell you. Let me help you put it in context. Let me help you explain to your parents why it's been worth it. Surgery, the opening, exploration, repair of the living human body is an awesome responsibility only afforded to a very few. To be privileged to be counted among those is a high honor. Roger Sherman said that. Surgery, I think, is the greatest job there is. It's the greatest job there is. It's the greatest way you can possibly think of to make a living. Helping other people in a truly substantial way, every single day a chance to save a life. It's a really great. And the worst job on earth has got to be being a bad surgeon. Hell on earth. Every day is another disaster, another wound to hissance, another anastomosis leaking, another air ambulance. I can't imagine a job worse than being a crummy surgeon. And that is the difference that your residency has made for you. It's the difference between having the best job on earth in the worst job on earth. That's the difference with a good surgery residency. And that's what y'all are finishing right now today. You have a chance to go out and make this be the best job on earth. And I hope to God and I pray for you that that will happen. I'm sure it will. Thank you for letting me come give this lecture, Dr. Burns. Yeah, I'd like that. <laughs> All right, appreciate it.
But it's a brief video with Dr. Barker. Okay. Anyway. Tell me a little bit about how you came up with the concept. Yeah, that sounds that loud. Yeah, that's more than loud. We probably. Okay. Good deal. Actually, yeah, that's my part. I'm really close to the receiver on that oh. particular video because I was giving the interview. I see. And Dr. Barker is, you know, a little bit further away, probably five feet, so it won't be quite that loud, but it'll be good. Okay. Good Thank deal. you very much. You're welcome.
You just gonna use this mic. Uh, you don't need this to. Okay. Yeah. I have always one of the things that always bothers me is people don't. It's almost like they're shy people. And the worst thing to do, especially when you feel like me, I'm not exactly impaired here in so you know, I can't ever tell me the last I've ever done. It ought to be like MGM on the toilet. I don't know if you we get everybody back in, we'll, we'll get started. Everybody back in pretty much, Cindy? Five people. Five people, okay. All right, that's good. Dr. Barker dragging up the rear there is... A few more people came in during the during uh, while we were talking earlier. Um, Dr. Mike Rowe came in. Of course, Dr. Mark Rowe's here all the time, but he he graduated from medical school over it was Bowman Gray at that time. So he and Dr. Meredith have known each other for quite some time, and uh, he's another one of our alumnus of our program. We were happy we got him back here. Um, I keep waiting for. Cindy Rudolph to show her head out there. There she is. I do want to a a acknowledge that uh, some of the people that really make this work, key among them uh, being Cindy Rudolph, and we'll recognize her again tonight, Maggie Hamblin, because uh, these, these kind of things don't just occur. Uh, and then in terms of uh, our research activities in particular that we're about to hear about, uh, Pat Lewis, who's been a long time coordinator of that effort, and, and Christy Westmoreland, who's really moved it to another level in terms of the organizational structure. We really appreciate what they do for us. So our next talk, as you see the title there, uh, is going to be uh, about, about some of our research activities. Nick Drehus is a native Georgian who is a graduate of the Medical College of Georgia. Uh, and uh, is going back down to Georgia, uh, north just north of Atlanta, in general surgery practice. Uh, he is really he's been a super resident. He's uh, he's quiet, but he buries he carries a big stick. Uh, doesn't speak loud, but carries a big stick, I guess. Uh, and we have really enjoyed having him here, and we'll talk a little bit more about him tonight. But I'm looking forward to your presentation, Nick. Thank you, Dr. Burns. I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll try to speak up for you. Okay. All right. Good. As, as Dr. Burns pointed out, my paper's title, or my uh, talk today is titled Landmark Papers in General Surgery from Chattanooga, which, uh, for those of you that don't know, is a, is a publication uh, that's selected several articles in general surgery over the years that have, have really kind of shaped how we practice today. And, and in thinking about what kind of things I want to talk about, I came up with uh, this idea to uh, review some of the research we put out here over the years and, uh, and try to highlight a few of the things that really make our program special. So uh, I hope you guys uh, enjoy this, uh, maybe are educated a little. It's a lot of as many of these papers. They're so uh, first of all, I have no disclosures, uh, obviously. The two primary objectives really are to uh, outline the development of our clinical research curriculum into our re surgical residency program, and I'll hit that right up front. And the, uh, other, uh, the other is to highlight the prominent publications, of course, uh, that uh, occurred both before and after the uh, implementation of this, uh, of, uh, of this curriculum. So to start off, uh, this, this may be an equally appropriate title for my talk, Clinical Research During Surgery Residency, the Chattanooga Approach. Um, this was published in 2000 in the Journal of Current Surgery. Uh, it reviews the incorporation of uh, formal clinical research curriculum into our program. Uh, since the inception of our curriculum, uh, it, it, the, the rotations have been structured so that 
the residents would do four months in each of the second, third, and fourth year dedicated to clinical research. This is opposed to a traditional one to two year hiatus from training that's pretty standard at a lot of the academic institutions across the nation. So to evaluate the efficacy of this approach, uh, the authors analyzed the number of publications completed by 46 of our graduates and residents at that time. Uh, they included the publications published during the residency and one year after residency to try to allow for a, a delay of uh, article to press. Um, the study group was the, uh, consisted of 15 graduates that graduated from the six-year research curriculum and was compared to the control group uh, of five-year graduates that had completed their training from 1965 to 1994. So as you can see here, uh, the uh, mean number of publications increased from 0.94 to 2.67. Uh, and this is also demonstrated again in the bar graph by uh, uh, the control group having one or no publications in the vast majority compared to the study group, the 15, uh, in the study group having two or more in almost all circumstances. Um, interestingly, they uh, uh, sent out a survey. This survey was administered to the study group only uh, to try to uh, to tease out what the uh, study group thought of the six-year curriculum and their opinions varied pretty widely about how beneficial the research year was um, with regard to did it help me to gain uh, or go to fellowship did it help me in, in preparing for private practice etc uh, so but one thing that the respondents came back with a near consensus was that they felt that they had an improved ability to review the medical literature and a, and a better understanding of uh, research methods. So we'll kind of go back in time for a moment to 1985, a few years before the implementation of this, uh, of this curriculum, um, to a paper or a study titled Appendicitis in Mature Patients uh, that was published in the 100th anniversary edition of the Annals of Surgery. Um, because of the world's population's increasing average age, uh, this study attempted to look at the group of patients over, than fi over 50 years of age uh, who had acute appendicitis. Uh, a comparison group was formed. Uh, it was a, a second series of 103 consecutive patients that were aged from 25 to 50 that were very similar, with, again, a diagnosis of acute appendicitis in, uh, in, a, in a very similar time period. Uh, and these, the data for these both groups were reviewed, of course. After applying the inclusion and exclusion criteria listed there, uh, 96 patients remained in the mature study group and uh, 91 in the young control group. Uh, the data collected uh, included admission history, physical exam, lab data, uh, imaging, and of course uh, the patient's clinical course. Uh, you see in the bar graph some of the results uh, that demonstrated a much higher perforation rate, 65% uh, in the uh, older group compared with 35% in patients aged 25 to 50. Uh, as you might expect, complications uh, likewise were, uh, were, there was a disparity with 60% in the uh, mature group and 14% in the young. Um, there was a pretty low mortality in both groups. Uh, in fact, there were only three patients who uh, died, but the, uh, those three were noted to all be in the age over 50 range with none uh, in the young group. Uh, as you can see, there was also one of the factors we look at in frequently in, in articles, length of stay in the hospital, greater than five days in this paper cited, uh, over, or was cited to be 85% in older patients uh, as compared to about uh, 44%. So the data analysis also was con conducted by a decade of life. They broke down, you know, by 20 to 30, or you know, 25 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, uh, again, to look at perforation and some of the uh, complications to try to determine if there was a, a, a different cutoff than 50 that we should be looking at. Uh, and this actually demonstrated that there's an increased incidence of perforation in the 40 to 50 age group as well as those older than 50. So based on this, the authors concluded higher rates of perforation that had a more rapid pathophysiologic progression of appendicitis occurring in increasing age. Uh, clearly, perforation is 
one of the single most important factors with regard to the patient's morbidity. And they've even posited that with uh, a low false positive diagnostic rate and positive complications during exploratory surgery, that at least at this institution, we should be more aggressive uh, with regard to patients that had suspe suspected appendicitis. Another common surgical disease is uh, inguinal hernia, and in the early 90s, laparoscopy was gaining uh, acceptance, though the data with regard to laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair was still very limited. Uh, many of the uh, institutions publishing on this topic felt that the safety, efficacy, and histologic changes could be better be characterized in an animal model. And with this in mind, Lehman and others developed this prospective randomized controlled trial using a SWAN model. Uh, they cited four objectives to assess uh, effectiveness of repair in a rapidly growing animal, the extent of adhesions for use of uh, different proth prosthetic meshes, in this case uh, selecting Gore-Tex, Marlex, or Proline, uh, the effect of repair on testicular growth of the swine, and of course histologic effects at the uh, hernia site. And in this study, they used 30 juvenile swine with 35 congenital indirect hernias uh, that underwent a simplified laparoscopic technique that I'll talk more about in a second. Uh, these uh, animal, animals were randomized to three different prosthetic meshes, uh, 10 in each group, uh, and the subjects were observed for a period of about 90 days. The simplified repair, simplified repair uh, described in the paper is that of an intraperitoneal stapling of mesh prosthesis directly over the hernia defect. Uh, the, this was selected for two purposes. Uh, first, to address the primary concern of preventing strangulation or incarceration by entry of the abdominal contents into the hernia. And secondly, uh, the swine peritoneum was very fragile and didn't, because it tore so easily, didn't lend itself to uh, dissection without extreme difficulty, so an extra peritoneal or transabdominal approach wasn't really feasible. At the end of the 90-day observation period, uh, the subjects had an average weight gain of 61 kilograms uh, and noted to have normal testicular development. Uh, the meshes demonstrated no difference uh, with adhesion formation uh, nor uh, incorporation, which was cited to be 90 percent or more for all three uh, types of mesh used. The uh, authors did note that the, uh, in a subjective way, that the close apposition of the uh, mesh to the tissue resulted in best ingrowth, which is something that had been suspected. Uh, complication rate in the study was 17 percent, with five of the uh, 30 subjects having uh, one of the following complications. Uh, they were all found during the observation period of 90 days, and they included repair failure, obstruction, uh, repair failure with obstruction and testicular torsion in one uh, animal subject. No additional hernia recurrences were identified at the conclusion of the 90 days uh, in the other 25 animals. The 8.6 percent repair failure rate was interestingly attributed to uh, staple failure from an endoscopic stapler that was a, a prototype used early in the study. Uh, later in the study, a uh, better stapler was used and it was felt that better apposition of the mesh to the peritoneum was achieved and led to uh, improved rate of, uh, of success for the remaining subjects. In conclusion, the authors found that this was an effective animal model uh, it, it, uh, and uh, good for a technique for studying laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. Uh, they were able to show that testicular development was unaffected. Uh, the histologic changes were unremarkable for, for the most part, and that, uh, uh, and that this uh, per was ultimately presented at the Southeastern Surgical Congress and awarded a third place paper, which uh, I remember Dr. Burns commenting in a, in a different forum that uh, if not for the issues with the, the failure or the repair failure rate, it very well would have likely won the first place award. Of course, this wasn't the last, uh, the last uh, article or study to be uh, recognized at a major meeting. In the mid-90s, our tra trauma subsection undertook uh, this project, which uh, they empirically designed to screen multiply injured high-risk trauma patients, which we'll define in a second, for deep vein thrombosis. Uh, 
their secondary outcomes also included identifying risk factors for uh, DBT and to evaluate the efficacy of uh, IVC filter placement or inferior vena cava filter placement in uh, the prevention of PEs. Uh, this was carried out with a protocol to obtain bilateral lower extremity uh, venous duplexes on hospital day number three and weekly thereafter until discharge or diagnosis of DVT. Uh, during the uh, uh, time period in, from uh, late 1993 to December of 1994, 228 adult trauma patients were entered who met the following inclusion criteria as high-risk uh, trauma patients. Uh, these included patients who were bed rest for greater than three days, had uh, lower extremity fractures, uh, pelvic fractures, or spinal fractures with paralysis. Uh, again, a historical control was used in this study. Uh, this consisted of 234 high-risk trauma patients that were admitted in the 14 months preceding the study period. Uh, and uh, this, of course, was compared to the study group. <laughs> So the study group demonstrated a 17% incidence of uh, DVT. Um, notably, 32 of the 39 patients, who, so 39 patients had ultrasound detected DVTs, and only seven of those had uh, correlating physical exam findings. So essentially, 32 of these 39 were uh, asymptomatic and would have had delayed treatment or uh, potentially uh, increased morbidity from uh, a misdiagnosis. Of 29, 29 of the 39 patients uh, underwent early or immediate inferior vena cava filter placement, and none of this uh, subset developed a PE. Uh, the other 10 uh, had anticoagulation alone, and one of which uh, ultimately had a fatal PE. Comparing this to the historical group, we see that uh, this group who did not have any screening ultrasounds uh, had a total of six PEs. Um, and this is interesting considering that the, the uh, population had an actually much low, well, a significantly, uh, statistically significant lower injury severity score, uh, shorter ICU length of stay, shorter hospital length of stay, and a lower incidence of lower extremity fracture. So seemingly a, maybe uh, arguably a uh, healthier population in the control group. So based on these findings, uh, the authors concluded screening ultrasound with selective IVC filter was crucial in reducing morbidity and mortality of high-risk trauma patients. And this helped kind of uh, lead or develop the treatment algorithm that's very much the foundation of what we, we do today. Of course, uh, this is going to be familiar to everybody, the, the vacuum pack uh, technique that uh, colloquially we've coined the Barker vac. This for the management of the open abdomen uh, was described at least here by our institution in 95 and 2000 and this, the, the one I'm going to discuss here in a little bit is uh, a sequel to that that boasted a larger patient population uh, and included some surgical patients from general and vascular subpopulations as well as the uh, trauma population. Uh, but before we get much further into that, I, uh, I wanted to share this clip of Dr. Barker uh, describing this innovation. Maybe. Tell me a little bit about how you came up with a backpack. Actually, it sort of came from looking at what the pediatric surgeons did with uh, putting silastic silos on children uh, with the gastroschisis babies, and thalassic babies, and it was a way to cover the bowel in those. And when we had initially started doing it, we actually just got some silastic sheets or plastics, and it was almost like a Bogota bag type of deal where you just sewed it on uh, to the abdominal wall. When I was at Michigan, before I went to Kentucky, I'd actually done some, some things with uh, some animals 
where we looked at uh, some uh, response to inoculums in the skin. And we covered that with plastic and aspirated all the air out of it, so we got a good, a good suction on that. So we just sort of played around with this, actually, and, uh, and, and tried, some, tried some different things. And uh, actually tried putting some suction onto the, onto the uh, silastic covers we had and, uh, and sort of tried to keep the effluent out of the abdomen uh, cleaned up because that was always a problem. Uh, then uh, sort of noted that you could suck things down uh, and it sort of evolved from, evolved from there. Then we <coughs> sort of developed a thing about, about putting the tent tent right in so you could have some holes in it so you could aspirate the effluent out of the abdomen and then cover it with something that would sort of suck down and become rigid and still pull the fluid through and then and seal it all off and it, it, it just sort of evolved pretty quickly. Tell me a little bit about how oh. you came up with the concept. Oh, of now it's working. That's great. Uh, we don't need to watch that again. Uh, after reviewing their clinical and demographic data, Dr. Barker and the rest of the research team uh, identified 258 patients that ultimately over that seven-year time period had 717 VAX placed. Uh, the ages in this population range from three days old all the way to 91 years of age, so pretty vast spectrum. Most common indications for the open abdomen management and, and the trauma population was uh, damage control and in general in vascular surgery it was usually planned re-exploration. Uh, the total abdominal complication rate, which these complications included fistula, intra-abdominal abscess, abdominal compartment syndrome, reoperation, was at 15.5%. Um, of the 226 patients that survived to abdominal wound closure, 68% were able to undergo primary fascial closure. The total in-hospital mortality for all patients was 26%, uh, which just goes to show the, the, very, the severity of the disease these patients face. The authors concluded ultimately that the technique uh, of open abdomen management continues to demonstrate ease of mastery, effectiveness in patient care and comfort, consistently low associated complication rates, and low cost in surgical patients. I thought it was interesting as I was actually wrapping up this uh, uh, portion of my presentation that I stumbled uh, at, to the end of the article, and uh, not only was Dr. Meredith president of the Southern Surgical Association in 2006 for this to be presented, but he was the uh, primary discussant. Next, I'm going to talk about this article titled Simulated Surgical Skills Training, Modern Day Surgical Homework. Uh, during the 2000s, the landscape of surgical education had continued to evolve, uh, but even more so with respect to the difficulties surrounding mandated transitions to an 80-hour work week for residents, and thus decreased resident exposure and experience. Uh, and the Residency Review Committee uh, required all programs to have some form of skills training outside of the patient care in place by 2000. Uh, and around that time, Dr. Burns and Burkholder, Drs. Burns and Burkholder described the history of our surgical skills training facility that had opened nearly three decades prior, as he mentioned. Uh, with the support of the University of Tennessee College of Medicine and Erlanger, the skills lab was up and running in 1980. From the start, the primary objective of this facility was to provide a hands-on technical skills training in a non-clinical environment, though it's also served as a valuable resource for research, resident recruitment, and the rehabilitation of injured physicians. Uh, another point of, uh, uh, is the skills lab served as a, a training center early in the evolution of laparoscopy where regional, local and regional practitioners could come to develop their, their skill set. Uh, as, as this uh, began to take hold in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, all of the medical education departments here on our campus have used the skills lab for some aspects of their training, though our, the surgical disciplines listed there have been the most prominent. Both animate and inanimate models uh, have been available. The uh, porcine model have been the, has been the predominant animate model, uh, and cadaver, two cadavers yearly have been available for anatomic dissection and uh, 
and technical training. Uh, this facility itself is equipped with four complete ORs, as you can see in the uh, upper left-hand corner. Uh, well, you're right, my left. Uh, these setups uh, were uh, have the capacity to perform multiple simultaneous uh, animate procedures, and uh, each is, includes an OR table, uh, anesthesia equipment, and surgical instruments. There's laparoscopic equipment, operating microscopes as seen on the bottom, uh, your bottom right, uh, uh, a uh, endovascular lab, and laparoscopic and robotic simulators all available and incorporated in the, into the curriculum. The general surgery skills development cur curriculum uh, starts with basic skills as you'd expect uh, with knot tying and various suture techniques and builds on those progressing up to the point of doing bowel and vascular anastomoses uh, basic laparoscopy and then uh, even into the, some of the most advanced laparoscopic procedures. Uh, the model of pro this model of, pro of uh, progression uh, is uh, through increasingly difficult procedures and consistent repetition were found to be crucial to development of our resident skills. Uh, as highlighted by the authors, it, it is, and this still holds true, it's, it's, it is as important now as then that the surgical training programs continue to develop learning opportunities that truly are comprehensive regarding the spectrum, spectrum of technical training for faculty and residents. Uh, this next article I'd like to discuss is from the uh, Journal of Trauma, published uh, in 2008. Uh, Dr. Hildreth, uh, under the direction of our trauma faculty, posed the question of uh, does a single dose of automidate during rapid sequence induction in the adult trauma patient result in adrenocortical suppression and then clinically affect the patient. Um, these patients were uh, screened uh, based on the inclusion criteria seen here. Uh, the patients had to be trauma pa adult trauma patients uh, that required rapid sequence induction in the first 48 hours of their injury, but they were excluded if they were uh, ex thought to have adrenal trauma based on CT scan, uh, history of adrenal insufficiency or uh, steroid use. Um, if, these, if patients met these uh, criteria appropriately, uh, they were entered in the study and then uh, randomized to either the automidate group or the fentanyl and Versed group. Um, of note, before this, uh, baseline cortisol was drawn, the rapid sequence induction was undertaken, and uh, four to six hours after intubation, the cortisol level was uh, obtained. Uh, an ACTH stimulation test was performed and the cortisol level again uh, obtained. All of these uh, uh, laboratory data as well as clinical data were uh, collected and analyzed. And uh, as you can see in table one, the study and control group patient characteristics were very similar. Uh, specifically, I'd like to point out the baseline cortisol and the lung and head uh, injury scores. This is a little busy, but uh, the, the highlight here is that after the administration of Atomidate, uh, you can see a significant depression in cortisol level uh, as seen in figure two and figures two and three. Uh, and the, the bar graph is an excellent depiction of uh, the E group being the Atomidate group uh, dropping substantially after intubation and then the stem test in the third column, it doesn't rise nearly to the level that the, the control group does. In fact, it doesn't even raise up to the baseline cortisol. Other significant findings of this uh, study were that there was an increased uh, need for packed red blood cells, FFP, and IV fluids within the first 24 hours after the atomidate was administered. Uh, the, the authors theorized that this was likely secondary to physiologic alterations. Um, hospital length of stay and ventilator days were also increased despite the brain and lung injury scores uh, being similar between patient groups. Uh, the only patients that required vasopressors, abdominal decompar uh, uh, decompression of the abdominal, part abdominal compartment syndrome or uh, died were in the automidate group. Uh, so from this, the authors felt they could conclude the automidate did indeed induce adrenal suppression in a trauma patient uh, and that other medications should be used uh, if available in rapid sequence induction. 
though earlier studies, uh, one, uh, similar, such as one I mentioned earlier, uh, led to the development of our institutional DBT screening and treatment algorithm, uh, one question remained, uh, what is the optimal prophylactic strategy for DBT or venous thromboembolism? At this time, both low-dose and uh, low-dose unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin had emerged as principal agents for DVT prophylaxis in, in the hospitalized patient, who were, of course, the population of patients at highest risk of uh, DVT and uh, subsequent morbidity. The purpose of the study was to compare the efficacy and safety of these two uh, pharmacotherapies using low-dose unfractionated heparin three times daily versus Lovenox uh, once daily in an adult, in an adult trauma patient population uh, based here just at our level one trauma center. Using the adult trauma registry to uh, enlist patients in a retrospective manner, uh, 476 patients during the year of 2006 were identified that met our inclusion criteria. These inclusion criteria were patients admitted for greater than 72 hours and those that received DBT prophylaxis appropriately. During the first six months of the study, 237 patients uh, received Lovenox daily, and at mid-year, the prophylaxis was changed to, to low-dose heparin, uh, of which 239 patients received three times daily. Demographic data, traumatic injuries, uh, incidents of uh, venous thromboembolism and bleeding com complications were all evaluated by chart review um, and cost data analysis was also uh, undertaken. I'd like to point out that the mean uh, injury severity score for Lovenox was higher than heparin, but this was the only factor in this log logistic uh, regression analysis that proved any kind of significant difference between the groups. Analysis of the individual risk factors by combining both groups uh, demonstrated that uh, spinal cord injury patients had an odds ratio of 7.28 and closed head injury patients 2.7 with regard to uh, uh, DVT and this confirmed the uh, some results of many prior studies. Um, the most important thing uh, in, in on this slide to note is that comparing the efficacy of heparin versus Lovenox, there is really no difference between the two, either for the incidence of DVT, the incidence of PE, or even bleeding complications. Hospital pharmacy cost analysis was performed in the study uh, by multiplying the cost of the daily study drug by the total treatment days in each group. And this was then extrapolated to represent a yearly cost uh, by, by using exclusively low-dose heparin TID, uh, pharmacy savings in that calendar year for that uh, trauma population would uh, have been estimated to exceed $135,000 for patients that, were, that completed the DVT prophylaxis protocol. Again, overall, there was no detected difference in therapeutic benefit nor uh, incidence of complication, but in cost savings was apparent in using uh, three times a day uh, low-dose heparin. This brings us to the last paper uh, I'd like to discuss. This is one of the more recent papers uh, here. It actually is kind of falls into the realm of a quality improvement project, uh, which has been really popular in the last several years uh, in uh, the uh, research field and uh, in 2014 the Southeastern Surgical Congress selected hypercalcemia in the emergency department a missed opportunity as a gold medal winner much like some of the previous uh, papers we discussed. This, uh, this article focused on the question how many patients present to the emergency department for acute issues and have incidental hypercalcemia on routine testing. Since primary hyperparathyroidism and malignancy are estimated to account for 80 to 90 percent of all cases, uh, a delay in the di these diagnoses can really cause pa the, these patients significant morbidity. This retrospective review looked at patients with hypercalcemia, as we said, that came into the emergency department over the course of one, uh, one year. It uh, included the collection of patient demographic data. Uh, they looked at the percentage of patients who had a primary care physician it, uh, it value, they looked at the emergency department evaluation and then plan of care as well. 
the majority of these patients had mild hypercalcemia uh, based on uh, a range of 10.9 to 11.9 as used in our facility. The about uh, however, only 21% of uh, the subset had any documentation of hypercalcemia, which is staggering, as simple as it is to write hypercalcemia in the chart. 80% uh, of these patients actually had symptoms that could be attributed to hypercalcemia. So when you break the, the data down again and look at uh, those that were women over the age of 45, they accounted for nearly half of the patients with incidental hypercalcemia in this study. And that's a, that's a, a group that's considered very high risk for primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, this group also showed that 75% of these patients had symptoms that could be attributable to hypercalcemia, and about 68% of those had no documentation in their uh, charting. So the study pointed out a, a deficiency uh, in, in management of non-acute incidental lab abnormalities. And, you know, with so many patients experiencing symptoms that could be attributable to this hypercalcemia just incidentally found, uh, the etiology needed to be, needs to be further investigated, and particularly in the setting of surgically curable diseases like these that we mentioned. So that brings us essentially to the end here. Um, you know, this isn't, this wasn't an exhaustive review of all the literature that, that would require many hours of discussion. I just put a list of some of the other uh, notable papers that I reviewed in preparing this talk, and I, I hope that, uh, you know, this brief look back at the past accomplishments here has been entertaining and informative uh, for everybody. Uh, I would like to share this last video clip from my interview with Dr. Barker before we finish up, maybe. You have to be careful not to ignite the pencil on the scan, uh, to uh, make the aisle band adhere. Uh, and you all know the story about uh, Jacob Dowden, alias Ricky Bobby, who I personally set on fire in the operating room. <laughs> and just out of carelessness on my part, we had already put the benzo on the skin uh, so we could put the eye band down and then apply suction to the, to the eye band. And there was a skin bleeder, and my mind was somewhere else, and uh, I touched the skin bleeder with the, with the Bobe and uh, the benzoin flamed up and Dr. Dowden being conscientious resident tried to put it out with a towel at which point the towel caught on fire <laughs> and dropped it on the floor at that point. And he happened to have on the really high scrub boots <laughs> the halfway up the calf, the calf length scrub boots. Okay. I'm sure his fancy shoes. <laughs> and uh, so he caught those on fire, at which point he said, I'm on fire, Dr. Barker. And I said, you are not on fire, Ricky Bobby. Uh, and then it deteriorated to help me Oprah Winfrey, help me Tom Cruise, et cetera. And we threw some water on Dr. Dowden, put him out, and he did the operation. And since that time, he has plagued me about having to go to uh, therapy for his burns and having post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> That's the story. Not everybody makes a full recovery. Not everybody makes a full recovery. He has to realize he's going to have to live with some of the trauma from this. <laughs> Well, this is a, a this is a list of my resources, which most most of you probably know how to get a hold of all these papers. But um, I really appreciate the chance to share this topic that I found interesting with you all. And uh, I guess at this point, uh, we can take some questions if anybody has any. Yeah, have questions or comments? Yeah, Dr. Greer. Here, 
Or if anybody would like to openly critique some of these papers, that might be entertaining. <laughs> well, I just had one comment is about the, uh, cert the skills lab is uh, the effect of the medical students. We've had hundreds of medical students who have used the skills lab, and that's really when our most popular asset of our, of our clerkship, which we've lost recently, but I think if anybody ever goes back and does this again, you need to include the fact that we've had several hundred medical students who spend, used to spend every week three hours every Thursday doing nothing but learning skills as a medical student, which was really, really a great effect, and I'm sorry we don't have that anymore in any way. That would, I would want to be sure to add that if anybody ever looks at this again. Good point. I think I think uh, there were <clears throat> the the paper about the the backpack too the 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 significance of that in the trauma world was huge for a long time now I mean I think it's a little less so now because we've gotten away from the massive uh, uh, hydration or IV fluids that we used to have so it's not so much but uh, there were people from all over the world calling about how do you guys do this uh, once the word got out because abdominal compartment syndrome had become such a lethal problem. Uh, I think Wayne pointed that out in his discussion uh, at the Southern. So It's you know, one of the most huge. important advances in trauma in the last three decades, really. Yeah, it was it was huge. Uh, so uh, great credit to Dr. Barker for the idea and then, and then, and then carried it forward uh, as well. So we're very proud of that. Um, I think the stereotactic biopsy that you didn't, you didn't have time to put in, it was not it was significant in the sense that it it emphasized that general surgeons can do that. You don't just have to have radiologists to do stereotactic biopsies. So that one was more timing than anything else. There wasn't any great science to it. It was just a matter that we had it and had it available for our residents to do it. And, and that was something that, by virtue of that coming along and being published, then a lot of other institutions picked up on that as well. But, uh, and, and the paper that, uh, <coughs> that Dr. Giles and Anna did on the parathyroid uh, issues is something that's frustrated us because we've set the stage for the cop for the hospital to be able to set up a, a clinic and pick these patients up because they're still going unrecognized and we haven't quite gotten that done yet because we could we could we could help those patients earlier by most shows. so you pick great papers I, 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 and it was a great idea to do this I really appreciate you doing it that's uh, very well done as always thank you very much sure. Nick. So we want to remind everybody uh, before Jessica starts that uh, the program this evening at the Chattanooga uh, started at 6. Uh, we're not going to be in a hurry. Uh, we'll have uh, plenty to eat, plenty to drink, and, and a lot of opportunity for fellowship. Uh, so we look forward to seeing everybody tonight. Um, there we go. So it's actually up. Jessica Reynolds is uh, also a, a graduate of the Medical College of Georgia. Uh, we got to know Jessica as a medical student. She came here uh, to spend a month with us, and uh, most and everybody who came in contact with her was saying this is a real winner, and we'd like to have her back. And she's come back and done her residency, has uh, married, and had a started a family since she's been here and we're very proud of that. She's going on up to Kentucky uh, to be a faculty member at the University of Kentucky on their trauma critical care acute surgery uh, program and we're, we're proud of that because she's finished the critical care fellowship along the way uh, with our trauma surgeon Dr. Maxwell and others. So I, I'm not sure what this is going to be about. I saw the title and I thought it was interesting. So uh, we'll end up the morning with this presentation. Jessica, look forward to this. Thank you, Dr. Burns. Okay, the title of my talk this morning is The Neglected Disease of Modern Society, Evolution of Controlled Chaos. And as many of you know, my titles are not usually uh, mysterious. It's usually an interesting case of this or that. So I thought that I would save this one for the end. So to start off with my disclosures, I have no financial disclosures. Um, I will admit I am not a trauma systems development expert, but I am fascinated by the history of the making of our current system. 
and that is what the topic of this morning's talk will be. Um, I want to start with a quote. War is to be avoided, but if it comes, and history says it will, mortality and pragmatism converge on an imperative to protect those sent into harm's way. This is actually the first line of the preface, the preface of a, a recent publication called A National Trauma Care System, a, a title that we will circle back around to in the end. However, trauma, um, historically known to have significant advances in military conflict, is not confined to the military sector. In the United States, traumatic injury is a major threat to the health of the public. It has caused aggregate loss of more years of life than any other source of illness or disability. For every war-related casualty, there are hundreds of trauma patients in civilian life. But the good news is in both the military and the civilian sectors, there's been remarkable progress in trauma care over the last several decades. So this touches on the scope of my presentation. We'll start uh, with history and then discuss about wartime contribution, the political influences that have affected our trauma system, and then end uh, with a few thoughts on the current challenges we still face. So dating back to the Revolutionary War, there was a man named John Jones. He was a surgeon. He actually published the first surgical work by an American. <clears throat> I really enjoyed the title, Plain, Concise, Practical Remarks on the Treatment of Wounds and Fractures. This book actually became the guide uh, for surgeons during the war. As you can imagine, uh, at this point, trauma care was limited to treatment of patients, mostly with minor and moderate uh, soft tissue injuries. And the most common um, procedure that was performed was amputations. And then here you'll see a picture of uh, Samuel D. Gross in a famous painting called The Gross Clinic in 1875. Uh, Gross was an American academic trauma surgeon. He was known as the Nestor of American surgery. Uh, during this time period, he began performing animal exper experiments to determine techniques to successfully treat patients that had essentially been eviscerated as a result of stab wounds. His publication advocated exploration of these wounds. However, it was interesting in the literature 20 years later during the Civil War, Frequently, um, he did not do what he had actually advocated to do at that time. So that brings us to the American Civil War. During this war, more than 600,000 Americans died. The Union enlistments were 2.8 million and the Confederacy had 1.4 million. There were close to 247,000 wounds recorded from weapons of war. Uh, there are some statistics here about the type of wounds and mortality rates. And the, one thing that I found interesting, this is all Union data. There was a note that said the Confederate medical officers were indifferent towards maintenance of surgical records, and nothing comparable with this documentation actually exists from our records, which I thought was uh, somewhat entertaining. Um, but you can see mortality rates, as you would expect, mostly uh, gunshot wounds to the chest, abdominal wounds uh, were very um, high mortality. So then this brings us to 1861, the first Battle of Bull Run. Uh, there were over a thousand Union soldiers that were wounded in five hours. It was interesting at that time, the medical director of the Union Army actually considered hospitals to be general uh, nuisances. Uh, he thought uh, at that point, medical theory was still dominated by the humoral theory, as Dr. Huggins talked about this morning. Um, and <clears throat> in this battle, the majority of the soldiers actually succumbed among the pews at Trinity Church and uh, Church and the couches of the Union Hotel. And uh, what they found was it wasn't a result of the immediate trauma, but as a result of infection. And this is just a picture of one of the Union Field Hospitals in Savage Station, Virginia in 1862. So you can imagine uh, what it was like trying to take care of wounded soldiers during this period of time. And this is a picture of one of the first tent field hospitals. This is in Gettysburg in 1863. So at that time, it became obvious that frontline trauma was an issue, and they had to figure out how to address this. Uh, there was a medical director named Parlin, a surgeon named Milhow, who organized on paper an extensive and revolutionary am ambulance corps to tend to frontline trauma patients. At this time, you have battlefield nurses. They came, they tended to the patients, so they extracted both patients and the casualties. Uh, most of uh, the people, as you can imagine, with ballistic wounds ended up with extremity amputations. Uh, this was invasive. They were not sterilized their tools so wound care obviously was an issue um, typically wounds were dressed they were cleaned and then they were moved to a different facility that sometimes could be up to a hundred miles away and this is a picture um, I'm truly sad Dr. Fisher is not here to see um, but <laughs> as as they described um, 
how these stations were set up. They, they had amputation stations where the patients that had injuries to their extremities would come. The first person would amputate them. They would move down the line. The next person would try to stop the bleeding and so on and so forth. And I, I can just picture that. I think that he missed his calling probably. Um, but then it became recognized during this time that in order for this to be effective, there had to be an organized system of care. And they started putting a little more strategy into the development of their hospitals. Uh, they tried to locate near creeks, obviously, for good water sources. And then they started um, you know, with the different divisions, going from a regiment to a brigade to a division in the general hospital. There were many hospitals near Washington, D.C. The South had uh, one large hospital, and that's what you can see pictured here. Um, this is the remainings of the original hospital, and this was a picture of the strategic uh, appearing location uh, where it was somewhat guarded and protected. So <clears throat> at this point there was no unified treatment of wounds. Gangrene was obviously a major problem. There were reports of entire hospitals needing to be fumigated to uh, try to rid uh, the hospitals of infection. Uh, wounds were treated with uh, many different things. You can see everything um, listed here. Uh, quinine, they began using zinc, a Darby solution, multiple other things. And at this point, the Sanitary Commission for the U.S. Army actually, actually issued a directive. It is good practice to leave wounds open to heal by granulation, which is something that I think um, over time we continue to practice ourselves in certain situations. Then in 1895, there's a pretty major development. Um, X-rays were developed. Uh, this was a major advance in the diagnosis of traumatic wounds. And prior to this, it was actually very common to probe wounds. Uh, they needed to remove the missile, and they also needed to determine the trajectory to predict the organ injury. One of the most interesting examples that I found, there was a man named Joshua Chamberlain who had a wound at the Battle of Petersburg where they described using a ramrod of a rifle to probe a right hip wound anterior to the greater trochanter to locate a bullet ultimately found posterior to the left acetabulum. Anyone who knows pelvic anatomy knows this is just really not a good idea and you can only imagine what that would have been like. And then there was nursing care. Um, one of the most important innovations during the Civil War was the introduction of nursing care. And the nursing care model that began to be followed was actually uh, modeled after Florence Nightingale. Um, most of the, uh, the advancements that she made in nursing care were actually during the Crimean War, uh, where she discovered that um, Every soldier killed in battle during that war, seven would die of infection and preventable disease. So she really started promoting uh, better food, cleanliness, good sanitation in order to uh, improve survivability in the patients. And then there was the Spanish-American War. Um, at this point, approximately three decades of practical experience in trauma medicine evaporated. And this is something that over time you'll see over and over again um, where they make significant advancements and then when it's not being used it kind of goes by the wayside. They had documented that at the end of the Civil War there were some 11,000 surgeons and nurses who entered the public and private health care system and then by 1870 only approximately 200 medical professionals remained on the Army books. However, they continued to make advances during this time. Septic shock became a recognized entity. Um, crystalloid began being used for resuscitation. Um, and then there were also things that uh, obviously affected the probability of survival, such as x-rays with anal analysis of ballistic wounds and fractures, and then the importance of germ theory and sterilization perhaps had one of the biggest impacts during this time. And during this war, there were 1,400 soldiers that were wounded at San Juan Hill. Only 14 died from their wounds, so a pretty significant uh, difference. <clears throat> And this was the time period where you started to see some of the foundation of the modern trauma system. In 1912, there was a meeting of the American Surgical Association. There was a committee of five that were appointed to prepare a statement on the treatment of fractures. And well, once these people came together, this actually led to a standing committee. Um, the next year, the American College of Surgeons was founded. And from there, you see uh, the offspring of several uh, different committees and different programs. Five years later, the hospital standardization program was developed, which is ultimately now what we know as JCO. Uh, and this began the embryonic start of a trauma registry, which mostly um, at this point focused on patients who had fractures and the registration of their data. Um, in 1922, the American College started the first committee on fractures, and this ultimately became what we know now as the Committee on Trauma. Um, in the 1926, the Board of Industrial Medicine and Traumatic Surgery was developed as well. So 
<clears throat> in the same time that all these things were advancing and committees were forming, uh, we were in World War I. Um, at this point, we did not have the same lapse in practical trauma knowledge, so we did a little bit better when this war started. Uh, what we did find is that the French invented a battlefield triage system that we quickly recognized uh, that just simply categorizing the treatment urgency of the wounded would greatly improve the patient's survivability. And this was something that they implemented in the war. At this time, you also had a rise of chemical weapons. You can see multiple chemical weapons that were used there, and the shift uh, became concerned more on mass casualty occurrences. As you can imagine from the pictures we've looked at already, um, field hospitals were, were not equipped to handle uh, mass casualty events such as this, and this is the point where standalone medics actually began to rise in usage. There was a man named Wagenstein out of Minnesota. He published a paper, um, or actually published a bulletin, uh, regarding the open treatment of contaminated wounds. And there, once again, it was constantly needing to be reinforced that this was the best way to manage these wounds. And uh, his document was The Rise of Surgery from Empiric Craft to Scientific Discipline, Surgery of War. And he was really trying to stress the outcomes of, of how patients were doing when managed appropriately. Um, during this time, there continued to be new technology that was being designed and applied. Uh, blood transfusion and banking actually became routine and there was a commission appointed to address those things as well. This is a picture of the first blood banker. His name was Captain Oswald Hope Robertson. He was a physician volunteer in the U.S. Army and he built the world's first blood bank. What he saw at that point was there were some transfusions being performed, mostly by direct artery to vein anastomoses or indirect syringe and flask techniques, but he um, developed the entire process from blood collection to preservation of the blood. He was actually storing uh, the blood he had harvested on ice for up to 26 days, transporting it to the soldiers that needed it, and then um, proved himself that transfusion actually worked and people were surviving and they were doing better. He himself performed hundreds of transfusions. He also taught many other uh, people to do the transfusions as well, and he published his description of technique and his results in the British Medical Journal in 1918. It was recognized as one of the most significant medical contributions of the war, and he was actually awarded a distinguished service order by the British government. Um, when the war was over, uh, he went to China to work for the Rockefeller Foundation, and blood banking disappeared for almost 20 years. So at this point, um, the U.S. military forces, they numbered 4.7 million. Uh, there were 53,000 American soldiers who died in battle, but this was exceeded by deaths from disease by 10,000 people, and this was still a pre-antibiotic error, uh, which was causing a major problem. So they started focusing on how to evacuate the patients and how to get the initial treatment as soon as they could. So they learned that timely evacuation of the wounded through echelons of treatment facilities um, needed to be established as a standard protocol and that's in fact what they did. So their first tier was to get the patients evacuated. Um, this was often dangerous as you can imagine. Uh, there were corpsmen, stretcher bearers that were moving the patients and this um, original plan is really the predecessors of modern-day emergency medical technicians who still put themselves in harm, harm's way uh, to um, accomplish the same thing. And typically they would start off with their initial treatment at battalion aid stations where patients would get pain medications, uh, control hemorrhage, and then get splinting of their fractures. So to begin with, uh, the seriously wounded were evacuated to clearing stations, and that's the point where if they needed emergency surgery, that uh, is what they would do. Mostly this consisted of amputations and then debridement of their wounds. Uh, the survivors past that point were transported to evacuation hospitals, and these were the ones that were in a little safer location, remote from the battlefield. And that's where, um, in hopes, they would get their definitive care, and then they would, uh, sur they would survive and recover until they could return to the ranks. Um, and this system for evacuation through echelons of increasing capable care became the model for the trauma systems. So this is just a picture of a World War I era um, hospital scene that looks very basic. With a few beds there. And then in 1928, Fleming discovered penicillin. Uh, this became crucial to the Allied war effort. However, the interesting thing is this was not actually marketed to the civilian doctors until 1945. And sulfa drugs uh, did not become available until the start of World War II. 
So at this point, the idea of the ambulance system was introduced. There were um, <clears throat> two Union military physicians, Joseph Barnes, Jonathan Letterman, who designed a pre-hospital care system using a new method of transportation. They started out with every regiment possessing at least one ambulance cart. And what this was was a two-wheeled cart um, that was designed to accommodate two to three patients. However, they quickly realized these carts were too uh, light. That was causing a problem with transportation, and they were ultimately replaced with what's known as the Rucker Ambulance. Um, at that time, they also had the technology of the steamboat and the railroad, and there were some use of this for transportation as well. And this is just a picture of the Rucker Ambulance. Here you can see it is a four-wheeled, which they found better than the two-wheeled, a horse-drawn cart named after Major General Rucker. And then the ambulance system continued to develop. The first known hospital-based ambulance service was actually in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1865. This was soon followed by a New York hospital called Bellevue in 1869. There was a surgeon uh, in the Union Army named Edward Dalton. Um, he promoted carrying medical equipment on the ambulance. Once the ambulance was developed, he said, hey, there's other things we can do at the immediate point of care. So they began carrying equipment such as splints, stomach pumps, morphine, and brandy. And this is a picture of the Bellevue Ambulance in New York in 1869. And the coolest thing uh, about Dalton's thoughts on the development of the ambulance system was that he believed that speed was of the essence. And he initially, um, said that all of the horses should stay harnessed awaiting a call. Well, you can imagine this probably was not the best thing to do for the horses. And they later developed what was called the dropper snap harness. And a tack was actually lowered by pulley from the ceiling straight onto the horse. And they claimed that ambulances could be ready to go within 30 seconds of being called. Which I think may be better than what we do now. But we'll see. And in the late 19th century, the automobile uh, was being developed. So you started seeing uh, self-propelled ambulances alongside the horse-drawn models. Uh, some of these were powered by steam, gasoline, electricity. The first motor-powered ambulance was brought into service in 1899 in Chicago, and the first mass-produced automobile-based ambulance was in uh, 1909 in Rochester, New York. And this was a 32-horsepower four-cylinder combustion engine. And these are just a couple more pictures of uh, ambulance from this time period, 1900 Wooden Sun Ambulance, and then one of my favorites, the 1916 Model T Field Ambulance we used in World War I. So then World War II came around. Um, at this point, the social aspects of trauma medicine had changed. As with many wars, uh, lessons had to be relearned. In 1943, Major General Kirk mandated that all military surgical personnel leave all amputation wounds open. This to me is hilarious that they just have to say this over and over again. But people continued to try to close wounds with, with having terrible problems. And then there was Major General Ogilvy that said all soldiers with colon injuries require colostomy, which is something that was established for for many years. So the medics at this point had some understanding of blood types and transfusions. However, at the beginning of the war, uh, they initially met resistance of receiving the blood products to use for the soldiers. <clears throat> it was the official opinion of the National Research Council and the Army that blood was not recommended for hemorrhagic shock and that plasma was considered adequate. So at the start of the war, blood banks did not exist in the military arena. Uh, blood was given occasionally, but it was mostly used in small amounts for septic patients. And the U.S. Surgeon General initially refused to send any blood overseas for three reasons. First of all, he said plasma was adequate. Second of all, it's logistically difficult. And third, the shipping space is scarce, so we're just not going to do it. But thankfully, uh, we had the American surgical consultant, Winston Churchill. He recognized the importance of blood in the resuscitation of wounded soldiers. And he actually, when the appeals were not addressed, leaked the story to the New York Times, one of the quickest ways to, to get political things accomplished during this time. So subsequently, he was given the blood he was requested, and a system of whole blood distribution was organized, marking this one of the major advances in the treatment of hemorrhagic shock. 
So during this time, passage through the system became quicker. Time was reduced to four to six hours to definitive care, which was essentially about 50% uh, less than what we had seen in World War I. And this was mostly uh, contributed to the development of motorized transportation. Resuscitation routinely included blood transfusion. Surgical therapy became more effective and uh, started contributing to the improved uh, survival for serious wounded soldiers. So at this point, they felt that the system itself uh, was getting uh, pretty well developed and they needed to shift their attention towards the phase of resuscitation. <clears throat> So they had specially designed tents and where the patients would go and this is where they would get resuscitated before they went on to surgery. Um, at this time they realized that as these new therapies were enabling them to fix uh, multiple organs of the chest, abdomen, head, and extremities, the prioritization became much more complex. It was no longer how do we treat these injuries, but which injuries do we need to treat first, which we all know is one of the most difficult things in trauma care. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of the surgery uh, bunkers um, as well. And then this is a picture of an American soldier who was wounded by shrapnel who is receiving a blood uh, plasma transfusion in the field. So in the all-encompassing effort of the Second World War, there were many civilian anesthesiologists, surgeons, physicians that were all called to service who began to observe the benefit of a systematic approach to trauma. And they returned back to their communities after the war with heightened expectations. So the public began to recognize um, and began to develop the expectation that grievously injured citizens should be expected to survive if a system enables a team of experts to work smoothly together. So the American Board of Surgery at this point after the war made uh, multiple attempts to establish a new board of traumatic surgery. This was mentioned in 1952, which was two years after the start of the Korean conflict and considered at two additional meetings and then ultimately abandoned. And then we had Korea and Vietnam. Uh, initially in the Korean War and extensively in the Vietnam War, rapid evacuation by means of helicopter accomplished delivery of wounded men who were still alive with grievous injuries to acute care hospitals. So now it was uh, a new paradigm. Instead of slowly shifting through the echelons of care, you had grievously injured soldiers that were arriving within an hour um, of their trauma, maybe even minutes, depending on where they were located. So they had to begin preparing for immediate response, um, and that included vigorous resuscitation and definitive surgical intervention. Um, <clears throat> there was actually uh, what was documented as the standard of timely and effective care in 1961 by Frank uh, H. Van Wagener. Um, he reported the results of a study of active duty Army personnel who had died after unintended injury in the United States. And what he concluded, which brought a lot of attention to this, was that soldiers were dying needlessly. They were victims of therapeutic failures, either because of delayed diagnoses or inappropriate treatment. And this is just a picture of one of the helicopters in Vietnam called the Dust Off, which was one of the medivacs. So during this time, blood became uh, used extensively, but unfortunately shock and acute renal failure continued to remain an issue. Um, death from wound sepsis actually became less common, and what they started to see was that they were developing more signs of late complications, such as multi-system organ failure, and this was the shift um, to the main cause of mortality. Uh, there were three people who pioneered work, Moyer, Butcher, and Champion, that actually led to the recognition that patients in shock have uh, lost more extravascular fluid into the intracellular space, and this started giving a better idea about how we needed to resuscitate these patients and what the patients actually required to avoid going into renal failure. Um, so aggressive fluid resuscitation became the mainstay and as we all know there's issues associated with that as well so at that point renal failure became less of a problem but a new syndrome known as denang lung became apparent and that is of course what we know as ARDS now the reason for the name was the um, the hospital in Vietnam where they saw so many of these cases and at this time there was also um, a lot of uh, politics in the news um, back in the states the public was really becoming more aware of what was going on in the war of vietnam and their awareness also grew concerning the system of trauma care available in the military which was routinely saving the lives of serious wounded soldiers so the question became why can't we do this for our civilians as well 
And that leads us to the development and the contribution of the, the first major municipal hospitals. Although we have learned an extraordinary amount from the military experience, large municipal hospitals in major cities have also had substantial influence on the treatment of these injured patients. Um, throughout the 20th century, uh, multiple municipal hospitals developed in many major cities. They were mostly teaching hospitals in urban environments with special interest in trauma and acute care. Um, surgeons in training found that they acquired considerable experience, but the problem was when the surgeons went out to train, they didn't have the support system that they had at the municipal hospitals and, and the patients were not doing as well as what they saw in the trauma centers. So the problem of preventable deaths among these injured patients um, was widely and repeatedly ported, reported. And that's when the concept evolved that trauma care was superior in specialized centers and trauma systems could improve outcomes if the injured patients were preferentially transported to these hospitals. So in 1966, um, the evolution of trauma care systems for the civilians accelerated. Uh, there were two major trauma centers established, Cook County in Chicago and San Francisco General. The rationale for development at this time, Title, eight, title 18 and 19, uh, Medicare and Medicaid had just been introduced. This left the old city and county hospitals essentially without any patients. You had a rise of urban violence, uh, increased urban ghettos, drug-related violence, and the concept of a trauma center was pivotal to this overall need. Um, shortly after these two trauma centers were developed, uh, the political and administrative genius of R. Adams Cowley were combined when he established the Maryland system of trauma care, which eventually became a statewide system. And this is where I will start to discuss the politics of trauma system development. And this is where uh, the title for my presentation came from, was the NRC's 1966 report on accidental death. Um, at that point, injury in America had been increasingly subjected to public scrutiny. Local, state, and federal agencies declared death and disability from injury a public health problem. Since the 60s, um, it was seen over and over again, the government intervening to try to support research, uh, regulations, and budget to support the development of EMS systems in order to try to reduce the burden of injury. <clears throat> so this was called accidental death and disability, the neglected disease of modern society. And the point that the article was making was accidental injury became known as a health problem and trauma care was deemed a political issue. Uh, this document was prepared after three years of deliberations by individuals appointed to the Committee on Shock and the Committee on Trauma. Um, they were proposing that strong government leadership was going to be essential to the effort to um, solve the neglected epidemic of death and disability from injury. So they called for training, education, and research to improve the expertise and fund knowledge available regarding treatment of injury and emergency medical care in general. So they established that optimal treatment had to start in the pre-hospital phase and that author and the authors recommended creation of established standards for ambulance service. So this included the vehicle uh, construction, also the credentialing of the attendants. They also identified radio communication as being uh, critical um, in the pre-hospital setting and then they began to <clears throat> began to address uh, the fact that they knew there would be tardy and an inadequate physician responses at times to trauma care. And the way that they did this is they uh, started the emergence of uh, a specialty um, involving special training and immediate care. And this prediction actually helped inspire what we know now as emergency medicine. So the document also called for outside agencies with regulatory authority to categorize hospitals. Um, they started with four categories, and this ranged anywhere from first aid facilities to fully capable centers. They felt that the hospital and the providers at the hospital should be held accountable for the outcomes, and thus they began developing registries. Um, they were hoping to get valid, reliable data, including information from autopsies. Uh, so the budget for injury research at this point was inadequate. Um, they called for establishment of the National Institute of Trauma within the Public Health Service. And even though this was requested in 1966, even uh, the following several years, repeatedly no actions have actually succeeded towards this end that I'm aware of. So the way that Congress responded uh, to this uh, was by enacting legislation, and they came out with the National Highway Safety Act of 1966. Um, <clears throat> 
It was targeting the Department of Transportation. They were given authority, money, and instruction to implement the law. And the aim was that they would reduce motor vehicle accidents to develop uh, effective car safety by developing effective car safety devices. And they emphasized in the document that coordination, transportation, and communication are necessary to bring injured persons and definitive medical care together in the shortest practical time. And that's the point where funding of ambulance services uh, became part of the National Highway Traffic Safety Program. So there were three main states that really capitalized on this funding, Maryland, Florida, and Illinois. Uh, they pioneered a development of their regional EMS programs, including the trauma systems. Um, in 1969, um, <clears throat> R. Adams Cowley at the University of Maryland and the state police actually cooperated a unique program. Uh, their first development of their trauma center started with police transport of patients by helicopter from the scene of injury to a dedicated trauma center. And they found that this um, achieved dual goals of rapid evacuation and the timely treatment of shock. And this was also the point where uh, helicopters were being used to trans transport patients from regional hospitals. <clears throat> and what they found is that their, morta their mortality rates uh, of seriously injured patients improved significantly. Then in Jacksonville, Florida, Waters and Wells reported a 38% reduction in frequency of traffic accident deaths and implementation after the implication um, of their system. Um, they focused on pre-hospital resources, rescue squads with trained crews, and improved communication. And this was followed by Illinois. Um, they developed a landmark statewide trauma system in the early 70s that was modeled after um, the concept of a trauma care unit in Cook County. Uh, this was developed under political activity under the state government with active participation of the governor. And it had five main components that you can see listed there, uh, categorization, uh, communication technology, ambulance design, um, training and then uh, the trauma registry is what they ultimately describe. They concluded that the system had reduced death rates for critically injured patients in rural but not the urban regions of the state. So after these three states developed their system, uh, public funds were converted into successful investments and the characteristic of regional trauma systems were defined. Um, these systems became prototypes and they became compelling examples of successful healthcare policy because in each case, evidence indicated that implementation of a trauma system was saving lives. And in 1973, there was the Emergency Medical Service Systems Act. This allowed regional funding to develop and operate their EMS. Um, there was an expenditure of $300 million over eight years that led to establishment of 304 EMS regions. And in 1975, <clears throat> Cowley coined the term that uh, most of us are familiar with called the golden hour. Um, <clears throat> in a 1975 article stated that the first hour after injury will largely determine a critically injured person's chances for survival. And this was just part of, of several things uh, that were coined that were moving forward in the 1970s. Uh, defining the key characteristics of a trauma center became the principal emphasis in evaluating the systematic care of injured patients. Um, in 1971, the AMA proposed a scheme uh, based on a pre-hospital emergency care. Um, 1976, the Committee on Trauma produced optimal criteria for care of the injured patients, and this is something that uh, we continue to use in establishing regional and state trauma systems. And then in 1978, ATLS uh, for education purposes was established. And then there was the Omnibus uh, Budget Reconciliation Act, um, perfect example of government intervention into a system. Uh, at this point, federal funding sharply declined for development of regional EMS and trauma systems in particular. And uh, what they found is that um, ter they terminated federal government support. They changed the method of their funding allocation and they essentially left it at the state level. So states were granted discretion and many states decided to um, to close their EMS systems after losing funding. So at that time there became a public demand for reform. Um, West published a study indicating that injured patients in Orange County received care inferior to that delivered in the city of San Francisco. And he published a paper that was focusing on the fact that two thirds of patients without brain injuries who died in 39 hospitals in Orange County possibly died a preventable death due to delayed or inadequate care. And then an additional study was performed which further confirmed this. So as a consequence of these reports, public opinion began favoring implementation of a trauma system in Orange County. They developed a level one center uh, followed by four level two trauma centers and their follow-up impact was that the system indicated frequency of preventable deaths had declined substantially. 
<clears throat> so the sequence of events that led to the Orange County development was public disclosure of a need, regional government's implementation of a trauma system, and then the re report of benefit after the system implementation. And this sequence became a template for development of other trauma systems. In 1990, the Trauma Systems Development Act was published. It was intended to provide health care planning support by developing a model trauma systems plan. And what they said is states that are willing to develop one of these systems, we will allocate funds if you're able to come up with an adequate proposal. However, um, five years later, this was failed to be reauthorized as, as many people were having trouble meeting the rigid criteria that they had put forth. And then uh, Bazzoli actually hypothesized that the political obstacles were one of the main explanations for disappointing trauma systems development during this time. Uh, in 1993, 20 states reported existence of trauma system administrators. Uh, however, there were only five states that actually met all of the criteria that they had originally put forth. So at this point, uh, funding became an issue. There was declining health care reimbursements in the 90s. This threatened the urban, suburban, and rural trauma systems as financially viable health care <clears throat> policies. The, um, as trauma systems have been designed, they required that injured patients receive immediate care at any time. However, they had not required patients to prove means to pay for care. Uh, so what this found was that um, patients with the most severe injuries were triaged to trauma centers, whereas those with less severe were treated at non-categorized acute care hospitals. Um, and this was having pretty significant financial implications. So Daly reported uh, during the period of 85 and 90 that 10% of trauma centers ceased to operate as categorized trauma centers. And essentially what these centers found was if they, um, they eliminated their trauma designation, then they were actually doing better uh, from a fiscal standpoint. So at this time, trauma centers who continued to receive many seriously injured patients were actually at risk for bankruptcy. And there was one hospital in, partic in particular in 1992 in Los Angeles, um, a level one center serving much of the city's indigent population faced bankruptcy. And ultimately, uh, this ended up with a emergency federal bailout plan by President Clinton after they threatened to close the center. So the end of the 20th century began focusing on finding fiscal solutions to continue to provide a level of care that the trauma systems demand. And during the 21st century, we revisited war. We had the Afghan war. We had September 11th, where we began to focus on emergency preparedness. We had the experience of the Iraq war. During this time, continued medical advancements uh, were also occurring. This was uh, the main time period where the use of negative pressure wound dressings on large soft tissue defects began to make a major difference as well. And this is a quote from uh, Dr. Trunkey in 2006. I thought this was really interesting. I was thinking about the timing of this. This is right around the time that I actually uh, started to medical school. But it shows a lot of the frustrations of the trauma system, um, what they were dealing with, what they were battling with. And he says, in summary, the current U.S. healthcare system is broken. It is a high cost, mediocre system. Access is a major problem. Pharmaceutical costs are out of control. Malpractice insurance costs are egregious and there's no question solutions will be difficult. In my opinion, leadership will not come from the executive branch of our government and Congress is so partisan at the present time that they elect officials that are simply impotent in dealing with health care and other problems. Until recently, organized medicine has not provided any solutions either. I believe the American College of Surgeons has been taking a leadership role. However, long-term solutions will require more than tweaking the current dysfunctional system. And this was really um, <clears throat> one of the, the last uh, big uh, publications as far as the trauma system that I saw from Dr. Trunkey in the literature, uh, but very interesting. You can tell what all they were facing at that time. And this is a, a recent publication from 2016 that uh, I put in here because I, I feel that it is an attempt to integrate the military civilian trauma systems with the goal of uh, zero preventable deaths. It's actually a fascinating read if you have time to look at it, but it really pulls everything together from the lessons that we learn in the military arena to what we've developed in the civilian sector and how the things need to come together in order to uh, prevent these preventable deaths. So the question remains, is the is trauma still the neglected disease of modern society? You know, the trauma system is perhaps one of the greatest public health care experiences or experiments of our time. Uh, the concept as a public health policy has developed substantially uh, since the original publication in 1966. 
There's been significant improvements in mortality despite a concurrent increase in the lethality of weapons. And the, the reason for that is three main areas, management of wounds, treatment of shock, and systems of organization. So the concepts and the definitions have continued to evolve over decades and they will continue to evolve in the future. The important thing to understand is the process of change, the forces behind it uh, that place the published literature in context and to understand what we've learned from decades of investigation. So in conclusion, history points out that a trauma system's characteristics are largely determined by the time period and intended scope of the system's influence. The idea of an inclusive system uh, has truly expanded on its an original intended purpose, making traditional measures of effect effectiveness too simplistic. Now we're focused on quality, time of recovery, patient satisfaction. These are all measures of outcomes. The definition of a trauma system may evolve in the next decade and economic measures may become the principal criterion. And those are my unorganized references. And I would just like to say thank you very much to everyone. I'll be glad to take any questions. <laughs> That's that very well done, and we, we would have to ask Wayne, please, to comment. Uh, I, as I mentioned, Dr. Dr. Meredith served as the, as the chairman of the Committee on Trauma during, during a lot, large phase of this and has been on it for years, so Wayne, you want to take well, off? First of all, very well done. It's such a vast body of work, and if you think back on it, I mean, trauma has existed since the dawn of humanity and, and with varying degrees of success in its treatment. Um, and you've touched on the important um, documents of, of that. I, I once gave a talk about the, the shock in, in Australia and one of the fellows in their shock unit said, so what you're telling us is that all of the advances we now have in the treatment of shock are due to acts of aggression by the United States of America. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, th this, is, this is really very, very well done. The current system has no plans for improving our trauma care. I mean, neither, neither the Affordable Care Act nor its replacement have any, any improvements. And this last document you showed is a... Uh, a potential avenue for us to try to garner some support through DOD and through some other things to, to maybe build some, some groundswell for support of the trauma system in our country. It's desperately needed. I think uh, there were two or three things that I just have to briefly comment on. One of them is your, your point about politics. And I don't have time to go into it now, but I could give you an hour-long discussion about that because we actually ended up with trauma center designation in Tennessee well in advance of many states. But it, became, but it came about because of the support of a politician. It was Jim Hall who ran the governor's office at the time. And if we not had that, we wouldn't have gotten it done, even though it made sense. The economic pressures were, are a big part of the problem. I think Wayne would agree with me. So that, I, that sometime I need to to uh, talk to you all about that and explain it so you at least know historically what happened here. Another thing about Tennessee, you mentioned about they finally decided to give blood to, to soldiers that were shot in World War II. The background that allowed that to happen was research done in Nashville at Vanderbilt by Blaylock and Vivian Thomas, uh, uh, bleeding dogs and then transfusing blood back because up to that point it was assumed that somebody was shot uh, apoplexy was what really happened. It was not the blood loss that killed them. It was the apoplexy of the of the event, mm -hmm. and that that science of his research is what then got transmitted into Churchill pushing people to use blood transfusions in World War II, which wide which ra vastly changed in part the result uh, of injured soldiers in World War II. Um, and then the other one, I, couldn't have, I, I didn't realize that Cali published that in, 90, in 95 because as a graduating resident, when I went up there and spent a week with him to design our trauma center in Memphis, uh, he was talking about that at that time, Adams Cali, that uh, ran the Maryland Shock Trauma, which was the, you know, that's the cynic went on at that point for trauma centers in the country uh, and still is a very fine facility. So. A lot of a uh, lot of things that Wayne and I at least have seen evolve through this. Uh, but that was a beautiful review, very very well done. Thank you very much. Thank Jessica. you. See everybody tonight, six o'clock.
Chattanooga. Chattanooga, yeah. They've got on my calendar to golf and country club. No, okay. well, it's, it's, it's been there for the last several years. If it's on my thing today. Well, is it on your is it on your email? It's not on my email, but it was on my, my calendar. Oh, I don't know who put. That.